test, 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 test. Okay, we're oh, let's introduce this, or how would you like to handle this one? Yeah, I, I'm happy to introduce this. So there's a few requests for PIDs that have come in. Uh, initially, there was one for the range development, and then it was somewhat paused because there were other things going on, and so PEAKS was moved forward. Um, I did just speak with um, Ben from Davidson, is that right? From Davidson who said now they'd also like the range to move forward, but tonight we're mainly talking about peaks. And um, just just to kind of, I, I think from the county's perspective. Sorry, Garrett, as, I'm sorry, what's peaks? Did you say peaks? Peaks. It's a development, uh, Josh probably knows better, but it's down by Next the. Right below the Got it. cemetery. Got yes, sorry. by the cemetery. I'm there. Sorry. <laughs> and then and then range is up south of Trappers Point. So Okay, that one point some odd acres, is that what you're or was there more? Um I think it's bigger than that. Five acres. Five acres. Oh, okay, up above it. To the long old highway. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then where's the range? That one is south of Trappers Point, and would that be east of that, Frontier Estates? Is that the. I can't think of their name. The Warners, or oh. it was Warner and now. Warners, yeah. yeah. Okay. The CW. Right. But CW. Now. CW lands now? Okay. That's right. All right. So. Um, I guess in addressing these, and I've already sent out an email where there was out an RFP to get some, I, I guess, someone to represent the county through these PID discussions, and that would be legally and um, as far as the financial side. Then we were, but there was initially the range was trying to move forward and we said well maybe we do this one the way we've done it in the past and then we do an RFP uh, in looking at the RFP I guess some questions came up among staff and and we've uh, invited Marcus he was at that meeting and and then also Aaron um, Wade with Gilmore Bell he's not here but in in having some of these discussions there were some I guess hesitancies that perhaps I was more bringing up. I think Josh, there was some discussion that we had as well where we've had really two PIDs that have been approved in the county. One was for Rome. Technically there were two there because there was a commercial and a residential. And then one for Wasatch Peaks. And you know, this is rumor, so, and it's hard to verify because of state code, we're limited in short term rentals and what we can look into and, and enforce that way. But there's some rumors that, you know, upwards of 75% of the Rome townhomes are now going to be short term rentals, which somewhat goes against the idea of affordable housing. And, and so I think the discussion would be how does the county want to approach PIDs? And um, I guess for those listening, the PID stands for Public Infrastructure District. Might as well say that at least once for those that are listening. But approaching PIDs to say, how do we use it as a financing tool that can help bring about development and affordable housing without creating housing that's really unaffordable and pushing more costs to future residents as well so it's so maybe i'm wrong in my thinking and i know we all have opinions on on pids but 
I've never related it to affordable housing. I guess I yeah. guess I've related it to a mechanism that um, I don't know if I just want to be blunt, but it's a mechanism where either either the developer charges for that infrastructure in that PID um, in, in the lot costs for the PID is created and, and that charge is not in the lot cost. So technically the lot should be a little bit less but has, you know, the PID money's coming in over however right. many years. But I don't know how that is related to affordable housing. So I, I guess it's not necessarily related to affordable housing, but if the justification for the PID is to allow affordable housing, but then it's not really affordable and it's not targeting those that it was designed for, that um, we should just call it what it is and not use it as a selling point to, to get a PID. And that's more what I'm bringing up is if we're using it as a selling point, I think we just don't use it as a selling point, say this is not affordable housing and is the PID still justified? So, um, but it, it's, it's more complicated than that. And I think Marcus can be a really big help <laughs> to explain it as well. I'll just make a <clears throat> comment on that because I think you guys have both hit it on the head there is, you know, the, the PID is a discretionary tool, of the county, right? And so it needs to be, you know, kind of set up. How, how does the county do situation? Just a second. I don't, I don't think that is on. That sounded on when you hit it. It's okay. All right. You're a little tall, and so maybe it's a little ways away from it. There we go. Hopefully, being a little closer. Again, Marcus Keller with Cruz and Associates. Um, so, so I think you know I, each individual application needs to be reviewed individually, right? I mean, the, the the tough part is is that you may have a kid that hasn't promised any affordable housing, and so you may want to decide what tools do we want to give this. Taxing authority, or are they asking just for assessment authority? You know, what are we promising to them or giving them as an advantage to build their community? Whereas one that may have an affordable housing component, you may be more willing to give them more uh, flexibility and tools or, or bill levies or whatever because you want to see more affordable housing come into the community. So I, I think uh, Council Member Anderson kind of hit on the head as well as, as Garrett is that, you know, kind of understanding what you application is bringing to the table and then making that decision, okay, we may give them a higher bill levy because we really want to see more of the affordable housing component, and then we would suggest, okay, well, if there's going to be an affordable housing component, let's put that to the development agreement to make sure that the county's getting what they're anticipating, whereas in the EID, I don't believe there is an affordable housing component as part of it, so that would just need to be considered as you're looking at, okay, are we going to give them a higher level? special assessment for you, what does that propose and how much do we want this project? But I would say as kind of a caveat to that, in today's kind of tight liquidity market, these tools are very helpful to developers. And so by then just being able to bring supply into the Morgan County market, they're going to have to be the ones to compete with other market pricing and different things like that in order to sell their properties. And so allowing them to have access to this capital is probably more important now than it was, you know, ever since probably about 2008, 2009, when we've seen liquidity drying up. So just keep that in consideration that I think all applications need to be reviewed and evaluated, and that just, you know, working with the county um, or working with the PID applicant is uh, an important part of this process. So, sorry. That was so can I ask you a question? Go yeah, ahead. Go I've ahead. got one, too, after.
So it's not tied to affordable housing. It's not tied to affordable housing. That's okay. an aspect of it, but it doesn't happen. Right. And so some developments have it, some don't, some kids have it, some don't. And because Wasatch start, Peaks start. doesn't have any affordable housing necessarily in, in that term. I, I think more the discussion, though, is it's a newer thing, and perhaps the county in Rome could have gotten more detailed and development agreement like how does this look for the county going forward if perhaps there have been some holes that we missed along the way so I, I want to make I, I guess I want to see the relation between the county and, and the developer with PID because it, it sounds like to me the PID is a mechanism where the developer can use that and say hey this is what I'm planning on doing um, the way I've looked at it is I don't I don't want to come in and say um, pick apart their 30 lists of items they do to develop their property and say I don't want you to do this and this and this and this I mean by law can they present that and say if it if it works for their development why would we I guess I would worry also if it works for the development we say no we, we don't like it for this one we did like it for the other one and didn't have good enough reasoning and I'm, I'm kind of I'm a little confused because I'm viewing it as if a developer brings a PID and it looks like it's correct, then we move forward. We do a good review on it. Yeah. But what it's, ability do we no, have to it's say not an administrative? Not. You can't do PIDs because it's not an administrative decision. It's a legislative. It is discretionary. So it's not that if they come in, they deserve it. It's they come in and they ask for it. There's some negotiation. It's like a development agreement more than. Um, a preliminary plat where they're just checking boxes and there are some places who have who some cities and, and counties who have said we won't do them at all right and that that's a possibility which, which i'm not suggesting can, that we should say ones? that i'm just saying which ones um it's uh which ones uh like uh west jordan is it's probably a prime example saratoga springs that have just kind of said we've got Whether you agree with that or not, that was the direction they took. Whereas in a lot of you know more rural communities, they're saying, "Hey, we would actually like to do a development here. We would we would like to see you know even you know what what no, I won't use the word affordable because I think that's confusing, but we'd like to see more supply here in our market because we think that may you know allow people to live here within our more community, give people better opportunities to find housing here within our community. So we've seen people you know outside of these Wasatch Front." actually like this because again it, it's a similar development agreement here it's a, it's a negotiation tool it's an economic development tool to say okay if you want the bid submit to us in a letter of intent why you need the bid help us understand the need help us understand the benefit to our community and help us understand you know how this is going to affect the people that move in there long term so if we evaluate each application go through those three different checkpoints and say okay is this justified is this justified does this make sense with what's being proposed, then you would have the right to award them that economic development tool or the PID for their development. Okay, I'll forgive you for jumping ahead of me like that, but. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Wilson. Here's a brownie. <laughs> <clears throat> so I guess my question more is about the, the people that are gonna own these homes. Yeah. That's my concern. Is it true that a, uh, it's basically a bond isn't it? Yeah. Is it true then that the developer can pay off that bond early and continue to charge the people the same amount that they've 
I may defer to Sam on this one too, because he's seen a lot of these in uh, other areas of the, the country as well. But from what I understand, the levy is attached to the bond. So once that bond is paid off, then the PID dissolves. So once they've bonded and used their authorization that you've given to them, there's no reason. They can't collect it for O&M. They can't collect it. So as soon as the bond pays off, whether that's in 30 years or 20 years, if the development does well and the levy collects in more money, and the, eventually it'll be the people living there that are the board, so they can decide either to lower the levy or keep it the same and pay the bond off early. But once it's done, PID dissolves, and that's the end of it because it's just used as a financing mechanism to issue the debt. So you said one thing in there that you said, if it, if it doesn't make sense for the developer or if he can't make money on this, on the PID, which concerned me because he's already making money on lots. Well, let me explain that lots. really quick. So the developer currently right now has access to taxable values. So if they go to a commercial bank or whatever, they're going to be charged a taxable rate. So they have to, whoever lends them that money has to pay taxes on the interest they earn, okay? With the PID, they can issue tax-exempt bonds. So the developer, the lending institution is going to give them a lower interest rate than what they would have gotten in a taxable or private equity or whatever, you know, other mechanism they may have used. And so value is already created right there. So it's not taking value away from any individual or from the developer. I mean, it's taking it, it's not even taking value away from the lending institution because there's they just don't have to pay taxes on it now so they can pay more. I mean, the true value is taken away from <laughs> the federal government or the, the, the taxing you know authorities that would collect the interest or tax on that interest. So values generated between a taxable and tax exempt interest rate. And so as we look at that and that proposal, we like to say, okay, we know the developer is going to take a portion of that value by just having the lower interest rate, but how much of that value should they take? Some of that could potentially be shared with, you know, through the development agreement, through parks, I think was mentioned, what, whatever that infrastructure is. And usually that's spelled out in the development agreement. And so does that make sense? So I don't want you to think that it's, it's coming well, from, from somebody, that, well, federal government, but I don't think anybody's cried too much over them not getting some tax revenue. Are, but. You, are you done, Commissioner Wilson? So one add to what Commissioner Wilson said, I, I kind of like to put it in more than just words, but maybe numbers. So let's say there's a lot that was for sale for $100,000. Yep. Or let's say the value of the lot is 100000 If a PID comes in, and this is what I've understood, maybe I'm wrong, but let's say PID comes in and the developer says, I need to use... Um, some of these funds for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my understanding is that they can then use a, they can set it up, get monies from that PID, um, but like what was mentioned before, the, the new owner of that lot is going to have to pay. So I guess what I see happening in simple terms, the value of the lot's a hundred grand, but because they're sharing the cost for infrastructure, um, maybe the developer is going to say you only have to pay 50 grand for this lot but the next 50 years you're gonna to have to pay off the rest of the 50 grand so that it still equals the hundred grand so it's just isn't it just shifting I I would say that in, in a perfect world yes is there probably going to be some inconsistencies where somebody may not take into the you know net present value of what the tax rate may do on top of their lot over that time period maybe they, but the thing that's important to know is that anybody that moves into a PID is disclosed in full information based off if there is, just so you know, there's there's PIDs that have the ability to, to charge a mill levy, which I believe CW and WPR prior PIDs have done. There's some that just have an assessment, so that assessment lien. So if you go buy that lot and you're working with a, an entity to see you know how much that lot costs, they're gonna say, well, it's for sale for $75,000, but just so you know, there's an assessment lien on it too, for, for $15,000 or whatever that number is. So so that could also be a mechanism too, so special assessment and limited tax geos, but we can go over the pros and cons of each one, but talking more towards the limited tax, which I think is probably where you would see these somebody being like, oh wow, I didn't quite realize that. They would have full disclosure of what the maximum is on their property tax bill each year based off their valuations and everything else. So they would have that disclosure and we would hope that that would come into the price. But I think more importantly, the development agreement and the incentives that if somebody's going to move in and pay that additional tax, you can kind of point to for in the cases like WPR and things like 
well, you're paying this additional tax because look at that ski lift that you're getting as part of this community, or look at these amenities that you're getting. And so that's why, as, as I talked to Garrett, you know, over the last couple months, it's important to evaluate what exactly the PID is requesting and make sure that the incentive makes sense with what the PID is getting. If, so, so each one's going to be different, and just, I think, you know, reviewing that and having good discourse and, you know, hearing from the developer and their team and understanding exactly what all the amenities or what's going to be the benefits. I think each one's just going to be different, so you need to evaluate it accordingly. But potentially they could charge 100000 for the lot and more. Potential. So they, there could potentially be an additional tax on that lot once the home's built, so they would have a limited tax. But again, the developer would have to compete with potentially other housing supply that may not be in the PID to say, well, hey, if you buy in our home at a $100,000 lot, know that you're going to have to pay this additional tax. Well, that person may be like, well, why in the heck would I buy this one? I'll just go buy this one for 100000 That's not in a PID. And so that, it's on the developer to make sure that their market is within correct so they can sell the lots. Well, that's if the person does their due diligence correctly, which correct. I'm guessing 90% of the people do not. Well, I, I think now we've done so many different disclosure requirements and everything else, it's, it's almost getting to the point, I won't say maybe here in a couple years they'll be there, but when people go to buy properties here in Utah, they're going to think, well, how much of my HOA fee? And also, is this in a PID? And how do I evaluate that as well? Two years ago, I think it would have caught more people off guard now that we've been working with the Utah Real Estate Association. And then now it's on like Redfin, if it's in a PID and different things like that. I mean, you, you hope that doesn't become the situation. You can give people as much information as, as you hope <laughs> as they can take. But at the end of the day, sometimes personal accountability and, you know, their discretion. You, yeah, I uh, unfortunately. Did we not make that one of the requirements that Rome disclosed that? Well, that is I, that is part of the law. It, it has to be. the fine print you just you flip to the bottom till you need to sign it yeah. I turned my, my <laughs> cup I was yelling um, anyway I, I think it's just the do we actually read it and um, you know and to some people that you know maybe that added 2800 a year isn't that big of a deal but for some it is and so maybe it is more of that discussion I know it's not about affordable housing but maybe in certain instances there may be more disclosure than is justified in others if you're purchasing a five million dollar lot 2800 probably isn't going to break you you know a year but if you're barely you know you're buying at the top of your range and then you have this added tax i think it could at least throw some residents off for sure you know one one concern that i have and it's the concern that we talk about every time we talk about property taxes. The tax bill says Morgan County on the top of it. Mm -hmm. And although the vast majority of those funds don't end up in the Morgan County coffers, so to speak, they end up in other taxing entities, the school district, the city, the fire district, etc. If I'm a resident, um, most residents don't pay attention to where that money goes. They just know where they write their check to. So it is going to be a little bit of, I mean, in these situations, we're going to take some heat as a county when they come in to write their check. I, our treasurer, you know, gets cussed out every time somebody comes in and doesn't like having to pay their property taxes. Because even though it's not coming to us, and even though it really has nothing to do with the county once it's approved, we are kind of on the hook to collect those funds into the future. You mentioned the two different types of PIDs, and uh, we, we Several of us were at a presentation last week at a conference in St. George, and Sam and Sam and Sam <laughs> uh, gave a presentation. One of the things that was mentioned there, and I didn't catch all the details on it, maybe you can help explain, was that, as I understood, one of those types of PIDs does allow for an early payoff, mm -hmm. and the other does not. And yeah. in my mind, if I'm looking at an option for an early payoff, well, I like that for a couple of reasons. Number one, if the developer wanted to, after the project is, is mostly completed, he could sell the lot and pay off the PID for that lot, right? Yep. So that's one option. Or 
a resident could come in and say, I'm going to buy the house and I want to pay off the pit immediately. Correct. And then that lot is free and clear from the pit moving forward. So uh, I don't know, just can you explain maybe the differences between those two and Perfect. the name of that and all that? Fun and if stuff? I run stumble stamp, feel free to, to push me out of the way because, you know, again, some of the underwriters get a little bit more into the intricacies on some pieces of this. But I will say this, you're, you're absolutely right. So the, the concern with the limited tax is, is that it's usually ongoing. There, there's, it, it would be near impossible to pay off early with the limited tax. So going to the special assessment, which I would say a lot more of these PIDs would be done as special assessments if Utah allowed them to be paid off over 30 years, like the mill tax versus a 20 year cap on current PID. So that may change, so you, you see this. But the nice <coughs> thing about the special assessment is you go to that lot, as Jared had mentioned, you know, hey, there's gonna be a lot for sale. I wanna see exactly how much it's gonna cost. Some people have a hard time understanding an annual fee over 30 years. Or you would see it and say, hey, there's an assessment lien for X amount of dollars. I know if I buy this lot, my liability is gonna be X based off this lien. The current interest rate on that lien is X percent. So if my mortgage is 7% and the, the lien on the special assessment bond for my property is five and a half, I may opt just to say, great, I'm, I'm just gonna make that annual payment because it's a better deal for me and it may get refunded and, and even continue to be better. Or if it's higher than their mortgage or they just wanna pay it off, as you mentioned, some people just don't wanna have that lingering thing on their property with the assessment, they would have the opportunity once they buy the lot to just free and clear, pay that off, and then they're 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 still within the PID, but they're no longer able to be assessed or don't have to pay that additional uh, fee or cost that's associated with the PID. Did I mention that? Does that sounds okay. Well, it, seems a lot to hide, it seems a lot harder to hide, but I think it also provides that opportunity for you to really look at the cost because the concern I have over the limited tax is that. It may be very difficult for a homeowner to determine what that looks like in total cost over the 30 years. I mean, just because it's going to vary based on the assessment of your home, um, it it may vary. I mean, there, there's a lot of a lot of unknown there. It's much easier to see a number and understand what how much I owe versus saying, well, you're going to have to pay this over 30 years. I think there are some pros and cons with each one. And so again, I think it would just be application specific to say, do we feel like this justifies one or both of these mechanisms for their use? Because a lot of times they're used in combination. They may have a limited GO that's paying for a portion of it. So they may issue that for perhaps regional infrastructure and then issue the special assessment more for the roads and different things like that. But again, that's, that's just one of the conversations that can be had once somebody submits their application and trying to understand what, what it is they really need as part of their development. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, there are CIDs and LIDs. Mm -hmm. Do you know them? So the new legislation potentially coming out? Mm -hmm. Wait, I, I've read about them. I've done some research. Um, you know, I, I think everybody in this room probably has differing opinions on, on each and every one of those. I, I personally kind of... I personally, this is just, you know, what I, I, I believe having good conversations between the developer and the creating entity, which in this case is the county, is essential to having good development. I don't necessarily like how it kind of skips over that step and, and gives entitlements, but, um, you know, I take my opinion with a very small grain of salt. I'm not a legislature or anything. <laughs> because I know that on, on those, uh, it's either one of them, a CID or an LID. One of them is the developer has to pay it off before the project is finished. Correct. So it'd be non-transferable. So I, I personally, I mean, that, that there are some good tools for that. Um, so they can't transfer that assessment. But I would say that it's a very limited scope and really doesn't provide a lot of value to the community. So if there's a lot of value being par uh, provided as part of their application that justifies that they can you know, transfer these assessments so that the homeowner can pay them off at closing or there's a mill levy. I, I think it's just important for, for, the, for the council or whoever's making that decision to say, well, does the justification or does the benefit you know, outweigh you know, whatever it is that they're asking? So I don't know if that was a tangent or not, but what's No, I'm, I'm just 
curious about What's it. What's LID? So, um, so limited then infrastructure maybe. district, and then um, I think the, actually the new one's DIDS, Developer Infrastructure yeah. District. It's just new legislation that's potentially being posed where um, developers or property owners would be able to, to go through this process without um, consulting with the creating entity, so a city or county. And so that is kind of a tangent to what we're speaking to now? Well, no, what it is, is it basically makes it to where the developer has to pay it off before they sell or finish the last of the uh, PIDs, I mean the, the development, which means that now the homeowners are not going to be stuck with this PID or this infrastructure. Um, I mean, I've got some opinions and I would rather have that kind because the developer, I mean, it's either that or we go about and we provide the infrastructure before we even let a development come in because then the whole county is going to be taxed for that infrastructure. And I mean, those are kinds of things that I think we have to really consider before we decide we're going to do another PID because right now the ones in the Rome are getting hurt. The likelihood they are getting hurt by that public infrastructure district and uh, so I'm gonna, I'm looking at more of okay if we allow you to do this because what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring in infrastructure because you want this develop and development and you're gonna make money so if you're gonna make money in this thing which you should be if you're gonna go into the development if you're gonna go into this and you're gonna make the money then why don't we have you pay off that before the whole project's finished because you should be able to be doing that within the cost of selling the homes. I, I will just play devil's advocate just for a second on that because I agree. I think that kind of clears up some of these conversations that we've had and concerns, but the one limiting or there's a few limiting factors is that there may be people that wishes that they could have had the interest rate that the PID borrowed at versus having now to borrow at seven and a half percent mortgage when they go take it out. So. I, I think giving that flexibility is important, but I but I 100% get where you're coming from too. That you know, e each one's. I, I guess I just go back to my original statement. Each one's going to be different. So if there are concerns that come up like that, then then let's talk about those concerns. We can talk about them offline or as part of the de the review committee or whatever that may be. But um, I I think it's important you understand exactly what's involved in the PID before you vote on it, so that you're comfortable. To, to either vote yes or no and, and have that full range of knowledge. So so those are good comments. I, I, I don't want you to think I'm discrediting yeah. that. So I think before we approve any, we need to look at the all the options now that we know more because last year when we were approving some of these, we did not know. We did not understand it. And now, now we're getting a little bit more of an understanding of it. And these, these this LID or whatever the other one is, DID or CID, I, have to look back in my uh, notes but there's a lot of advantages to those where it's not going to hurt the consumer because like Mike says it says Morgan County on the tax forms we get blamed and I don't like it well and, and I think today's conversation isn't asking for your to approve anything it's just to kind of get the feedback so that as we you know, continue to discuss as the, the application gets prepared for your review and, and different comments like that, we kind of understand what the board's direction is. And so it, it does seem like anything that does maybe have a tax would need to be very hardly justified as to why there is a tax associated with it. And anything requesting an assessment, understanding how much that assessment may be and, and what the benefits the community brings to the county. Yeah, I guess I want to comment also um, I don't know if anybody, except maybe one or two people in this room, fully understand real well PIDs. I don't know. <laughs> but when the PIDs came before us, I, I know Commissioner Facro made the comment that we did not understand. I don't agree with that to a degree. Um, I read through the PID, did my best to understand it, and I think the main point I made back then was the person that's buying the lot needs to understand what they're buying. They need, they've got to see it in clear writing. We've got to f make sure that they understand what what is set up. And so I don't know. I, you know, we are trying to work on mechanisms that make it easier for commercial development. You know, we're, we're trying to do things to help 
um, development also in other areas. So I just want to make sure we're also looking at this with open eyes and saying, okay, what's, what's the best way we can work this in our county? What works best for us? I don't, and I don't know, I haven't heard with Commissioner Factory you mentioned Rome was, what, did, what word did you use? They're in trouble or no, they're, they're struggling or they're, what'd you say about the Rome lots? No, it's just that their lots, you know, it was going to be an affordable housing project and now it's, Oh, way out of the so affordable, the, and the then they also have to make additional. Like, they have to do additional taxes on top of that, which you know, I'm just, I'm just concerned. I, that was well, back to I, my first point. I don't think we have lots in Morgan County that are affordable. If you ask me, well, so, I thought, and, I, and I thought we made that very clear too. But if they can put it in really small print and blow it on by. That's the concern. That's, that's a concern for Correct. Me. Well, and I think it's important, too, to make sure that whatever is intended as part of the benefit or results of the PID, that that does get put into the development agreement so that it ensures that if you're expecting a certain product, that that product's delivered to you. So, when, I don't mean to do a lot of talking, but we even do when there's restrictions on lots. I know there's different entities, I shouldn't say we, but different entities will literally call the lot number out and put an R next to it. So so on the plat itself, there's a restriction. Mm -hmm. So it makes a person say, wait a minute, what's the restriction on this lot? But mm -hmm. yeah, anything we can do to um, make sure the person knows what they're getting into. Yeah. Well, so, if you're okay, I'm gonna go ahead and sit down because I know they wanted a chance to maybe discuss their LOI and go over some of the highlights or points of their project. So then at least when it comes back to you, you have at least a high level and then uh, other information can be done, but happy to answer any other questions. So can I just ask a question? I'm sorry, I was late and I had to step out. Please. You mentioned that you'd been having discussions with the realtors with respect to the public mm -hmm. infrastructure districts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think a lot of people do fail to do significant diligence when they're acquiring a single family home, but a realtor who's informed of the existence of a PID and a project that they're selling could certainly help people to understand that in this project, this is a public infrastructure district project, so there will be an extra assessment on your tax bill until the bonded indebtedness is paid. And and as he mentioned, the if the project is more successful, which means the values are higher, then the bonds are paid off sooner rather than later. It's not a fixed obligation over a long term. And, and the lenders take the risk on the value not being what there is projected. So, but whether or not the, the market's functioning in a way where there's disclosure results in price adjustment from project to project, PID mm -hmm. and non-PID project, that's a different issue and that is kind of what they're relying on. I mean, this is a tool that's been used in Colorado for decades. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think they, they have a successful market. I don't think Rome was ever identified as an affordable housing project, but I do believe that we did, it is townhome, or at least the townhome elements we expected to be less than the single family elements, which is true, but they're still very expensive. And from my perspective, it's, there's just a basic supply and demand curve issue, notwithstanding the fact that we don't want to grow exponentially so thanks yep thank you hello um, Sam Elder from DA Davidson uh, we're underwriters um, of municipal debt um, across the country um, in Utah we've uh, had a team focus really around underwriting uh, public infrastructure district debt um, and have done nearly every one of them in the state thus far um, there's 91 created today. Um, There's some councils that have started out as no's, such as Marcus alluded to in West Jordan that have actually turned around. West Jordan has approved a P PID there now. Um, but there are situations like that where people are getting informed and educated about these types of tools, right? And we want to make sure that we're at the forefront of that education and making sure that there's no miscommunication and that the council and commissioners can make informed decisions about what they're doing on these projects. Um, we've been hired to be an underwriter potentially for the uh, application that's in front of you for the PEAKS PID. Uh, this application is requesting both a mill levy and a special assessment bond. 
That being said, there's no intention to use the mill levy here. Um, the size of this project doesn't justify the use of a mill levy. If I was attached a mill levy to the assessed values of the home, it wouldn't generate enough capacity to raise a bond. So the intention is fully to only issue a special assessment bond um, that can be prepaid or can choose to be passed on to a homeowner. And we could mandate it within the, the, the governing document to have it prepaid upon building permit or something like that. But I think that doesn't give the, multi the maximum flexibility to the home buyer and that the home buyer could be paying if they chose it at a better interest rate on our bonds in today's market conditions than they could in their mortgage. Uh, so we could scratch the mill levy entirely from this application um, when we submit a governing document for you to review um, and only ask for the mill levy. We've been told at times it's easier for bond council if there's some mill levy that the PID can uh, levy up to, so we could do like one mill. But if the council, uh, the commissioners wanted us to remove it entirely, we would be more than happy in this case. It's, it's not applicable. Um, the other option, as, as Mark had alluded to, I just wanted to discuss disclosure. I think it's a very important concept that you guys have brought up to our attention. We're hearing throughout all the municipalities. It's a, it's a concern and it's a valid concern. And we want to make sure that we're we are disclosing it and we're adding in additional disclosure requirements if the council or commissioners think that that should happen. So I think right now it's disclosed about seven times throughout the buying process. It's on your MLS. It's when you go get a mortgage, it's on a separate colored piece of paper. We've had it where it's posted in, in the sales office. I know for the Rome, um, they've asked us multiple questions about how to disclose it on their website. So there's a special page there that you can go ask on the FAQs about what you're doing in terms of the PID. But it is disclosed seven times throughout the buying process, I believe. And if you guys wanted to add additional disclosures, we'd be more than open to making sure that residences who, residents who buy property within a district are informed. Um, to your point, um, Commissioner Anderson, I think if you compare two properties adjacent to each other, one with a property tax and one without, the one with the additional property tax would, would sell at a lower price, right? Um, but market is going to determine affordability in the, in the price of it. Developers don't choose the price of their homes that they sell, right? The market dictates that. And so the market should be making a decision inclusive of additional property taxes, and that should subsequently result in a lower home price. I think to, to the point we would love to issue more special assessment bonds, it is a lien on the land that says if you were going to pass on $100 a month or something, it would be like a $10,000 lien. So if you sell the property and if the market price is $100,000, there's a $10,000 lien on there, they would have to sell it at $90,000 to result in the same price. right? And whoever's trying to go get a mortgage is going to have to qualify for that mortgage, right? and that's based on a monthly payment inclusive of liens or property taxes. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, our proposal here is to be able to issue special assessment bonds um, to pay for infrastructure that, as Marcus alluded to once again, I think the benefit to the real estate developer is that they get access to cheaper form of capital. And if they choose to pass that on to a homeowner and they absorb that, then the homeowner is, is ob obtaining the um, benefit of the tax exemption. So they're paying for their infrastructure one way or another, right, through their mortgage, which is in their home price, or through partially mortgage and partially our bonds. So I think it can be twofold, but I think this type of tool does allow a developer to access tax-exempt debt, which is cheaper form of capital than conventional debt. And as you guys have seen in, in the market, um, if you read any articles, banks have put a lot of shutdown on construction loans, right? If banks don't have money to lend, then we're not going to see infrastructure getting installed and you're not going to see housing. And if you don't see housing, you're going to have a shortage in supply, which we already do. It's going to ex it's going to be expedited or, or escalated and there's going to be an increase in home prices, right? So the idea is to um, allow for a form of capital that hasn't existed in Utah to be funneled here to help facilitate real estate development. and. To your point, Commissioner Fackrell, I think some of the tools um, that are being contemplated from the state in legislation have been driven by 
you know, some discussions that, you know, where people won't listen to public infrastructure districts. So the state is forcing it upon municip local municipalities to, you know, not have a d choice in that decision. I think standing here in front of you, having that choice to approve or not approve is a, is a strong thing. DIDs actually do, um, which was proposed at the last legislative session, th those actually do enforce a, an additional property tax and governmental entities don't have the choice to approve them or not. LIDs do require prepayment upon lot sale. So just to kind of talk through some of the different things that are being proposed, I hope that it's just, hey, let's have a conversation and communicate how these tools can be helpful and let's tailor how you want to see this tool be used in your county is probably the most important. One of the things I want to make sure that you, at least this is my opinion, is I would like you to have the option in that for them to pay it off if they want to, you know, when they buy the property. Uh, maybe they can do it, maybe they can't. Maybe it's part of their down payment, whatever, where they're not going to have that continuing. Just give them an option. Yeah, I think the option already exists. So I think what maybe you're at requesting is that it be disclosed that that is an option. That's right. So I think we could do that. I mean, obviously that would be a discussion when they go get their mortgage, right? But if somebody is buying it in cash, right, you could pay down the lien at that time. But I think if we disclose that, that would be a good option and we could integrate that within the governing document um, somehow that it would need to be disclosed that they have the option to prepay it for the special assessment bonds that we're requesting. My biggest concern with all of it is is that you're you put they put in I mean the developer puts in the infrastructure the homeowner buys the home the homeowner continues to pay for that infrastructure and yet the developer walks away well I would just argue that that's the same in when they buy a, a whole home and put it into their mortgage right they're paying for the infrastructure and the developers walking away yeah they're walking away but who walks away with the profit or who has the advantage I mean where's the advantage to the homeowner to do this versus the developer who's th on what side I think um, it benefits both parties potentially right um, in that as I described if it's prepaid upon lot sale it's just a more efficient financing mechanism for, for the developer to improve the lots, which ultimately results in higher supply. If the developer were to pass that on to the future homeowner, that tax-exempt rate efficiency would transfer to them. But that's the decision that they make to, to, to the point of complication. Somebody may say, I don't want to deal with a, an assessment payment ongoing, I'll just roll it into my mortgage and pay it over 30 years. The other thing that Marcus addressed is the assessment bond is limited to a 20-year maturity. Your mortgages are t typically 30, right? So rolling it into your mortgage actually results in a lower annual, assess uh, annual payment, right? Because it's amortized over 30 years instead of 20 years. If the assessment bond was out 30 years, it would incentivize more people to want to continue paying it. it's disclosed yeah and that's the biggest thing is making sure it's disclosed what well, like I said one of the other options like in we did in for for a project in Erda is that they required that they put a piece of paper in their sales office different color piece of paper in a certain font size that said you're buying pub you're buying a, pro a property within a public infrastructure district you're subject to X so if that's something that the commissioners would want to see I'm, I'm sure the development group would be more than willing to add that within the governing document. You know, I, I think that's great for the first buyer. It's the subsequent buyers that are not going to have those seven opportunities. They probably will still have three or four because it's probably still going to be on the MLS, probably still going to be, I mean, if it's if it's shown as a special assessment, it's going to be a lien on the, on the property. So there's going to be still some but it certainly won't be that there's an office there or a website that's going to say, hey, this has a, a PID. Yeah, that's that's true. I think one I would backtrack and just say assessment bonds have been around for decades, 
Utah has used them for decades, right? Daybreak is built on assessment bonds. And whoever buys property within Daybreak is subject to an annual assessment payment. There's water and sewer systems that charge assess has assessment liens on properties, right? This is not uncommon. I think the additional property tax is unique and new, and they are trying to disclose it, like you said, through a realtor on an MLS, right? And your mortgage, right, as you go get title. Uh, but there could potentially be a case in where somebody doesn't know, just like somebody doesn't know when they buy within an HOA. So I don't think this tool is any different than that, right? I think you're going to have a delineation between people that say, I want to buy property within a public infrastructure district or I don't, right? And the development group needs to think about that in terms of marketability. So when you ask for a certain mill levy, right, to put on, you got to think about the end result of how it's going to impact your marketability because you are competing versus others, just like HOAs are competing versus ones that don't have HOAs. Of course, in a market like we have right now, that may be your only option. Yeah, the you may not have a lot of <laughs> the argument my colleague made at the presentation that you were at was his sister's been trying to buy a house, right? And if there is a supply for her to buy a house in somewhere that has an assessment lien or an extra property tax versus not having that option at all, she would choose to have the option of potentially purchasing there. I think it does produce housing. It does accelerate things. It does lead, lead to better infrastructure because of cheaper form of financing. So I think if ultimately the county wants to see, you know, supply and wants to, you know, see house, housing prices potentially come down, that's how you do it. Now, I'm not going to say that's going to happen in a year or two years or whatever. But as you incentivize, you know, certain developments that you want to see, uh, this is a great tool to do that. And, and, and to the other point, too, you have a development agreement. And your development agreement is your chance to talk about what you want to see and not see within your county. If you don't like a project, don't approve it in the development agreement. But once you do approve a project, if you like that project, right, you're providing a tool that will help facilitate that project. May I say one other thing? You did a good job down there at Thanks. UAC. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any any other questions related to the PEAKS PID and kind of the next steps? Um, I know Garrett probably... So um, something that I did talk with Josh about at the beginning, um, we're still waiting on a few things for the preliminary plat and the bond can't be issued till that's approved and so I think the idea is just to do these at the same time so that when it is approved the PID's kind of already ready to go is yeah that, the, the one right? can yeah I mean that's not a terrible idea the one the one downside to that I think is that we can issue bonds once the preliminary plat is approved but if we don't have the tool in place we can't start the transaction process so from the time that a PID gets approved to the time that we can actually issue debt is typically like 90 days. So we have to, there's a 60-day contest period in which property owners can contest against the assessment area, et cetera. So what I would say is having the tool in place and then preliminary plot happening and then us being able to issue immediately after that would be the advantage to, to moving it forward now versus waiting. So, okay, and I'll just push back that it's an advantage to the developer because if it's not approved and, and then the county puts in that work, that's work that Agreed. doesn't come to fruition. But, yeah, hopefully but yeah. The, the county's compensated for the work that they do, mm -hmm. but you're right. I okay. Mean, there, is a, there is a potential for that. Okay, but, but the idea is you want this sooner than later because even though the preliminary plat's not approved, you would want to issue immediately after approval. Once it's approved, okay. if the transaction was at a point where it was ready, we could go technically. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to tell the county what you can and can't do, right? I'm telling you the reasons why they would, it would be advantageous to create it prior to a preliminary okay. plat. But if the county chooses not to, I think that's a discussion between the county and the development group. And then um, I, I do know that the current agreement has the six mills. Um, and you kind of touched on this earlier. Aaron with Gilmore Bell said, he doesn't say take it out fully because I think that there are some tax benefits to leaving in, you know, one or, you know, a half mil or whatever we put in. And so I think that um, taking the discussion here, I'll probably um, pull everything together, send it to the commission, and then we'll be in communication on how to move forward. Does that yeah. sound good? Commission, yeah. Commissioner the Newton. Big, the big <laughs> thing I chair, 
we've not seen any kind of agreement yet, so we're kind of in the dark. Right. Well, I think I we think they send anything. it out initially, but yeah, the details that we've been working on haven't been forwarded. Yeah, so far all we've submitted on our end is a petition and LOI per per mm -hmm. the policy that you guys have in place. So just according to that, that's how we submitted it. So we haven't submitted a governing document. The governing document really is what dictates how the, the parameters and how the tool can be used for this particular project. If we were to get that, we, we could remove the mill levy if that was your guys' request. We could also keep it in at one or whatever, but there is no intention once again to use a mill levy. Okay. okay, thank you. We sure appreciate you coming up and sharing with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We're going to take just a very quick three-minute break um, between our work session and our meeting, and we'll get started with our meeting in just a moment. Again, with an invocation uh, and Pledge of Allegiance, and I've asked Commissioner Fackrell to take care of that. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful this day for the opportunity which we have to be here. We're grateful for our nation, and even though we at times may not agree with everything, we're grateful for the opportunity which we have to be free and to be able to speak our minds and to be able to rule and take care of things here in this in our county we're grateful for the opportunity from our state to be able to run our local governments the way that we need to and we pray that that will bless us that we will be able to make those decisions that are best for our county and best for the people within that reside here we are very grateful and thankful for the blessings of freedom for the right to choose, the right to live our religion, and the rights to be able to speak up in this county. We're thankful for the input that the residents have given us, and we ask that we will be able to take into, my, into our decisions all those, that input that has come to us. We ask thee that thy spirit will be with us at this time. 
are again grateful for all the many blessings we've been given. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Fackrell. We will move to item B, which is our consent items. We have one item this evening, that is the minutes from the November 7th, 2023 meeting. I know there was at least one update um, regarding the prayer and pledge allegiance. That was Commissioner uh, Wilson. So I didn't, I didn't know, I sent an email to the commissioners with respect to um, Mr. Peterson's item, and I made a motion. I didn't state specific findings. I circulated them to the commission members. Should we insert those, or would I need to move in this meeting to reopen and remake the motion? Um, I think it would be fine to just include that because the purpose of including it would be for Mr. Peterson to um, have a basis to appeal. And so as long as it's in the minutes, he'll be able to do that. Okay. Um, so I've circulated those to the commissioners. If they're in support, I'll forward those to Julie to include in the minutes. That's a great idea. And then did we get those other couple items taken care of? I didn't know if they were or not. Okay. Changing. Uh, with Garrett's advice, I'm changing, instead of calling it roll call, I've changed it all to vote. So now I'm going to say vote instead of roll call. And he said there's, there's none needed to be called roll call. They can all be called vote. I've made that change. So I think in the past, there might have been times where a roll call was necessary, but the current Open Meetings Act just says that in the minutes, instead of saying unanimous, every commissioner has to have their name and their vote. So we're just changing the terminology. It's going to be basically the same, just saying the, what the vote was because we're not roll calling every vote. Any other adjustments to the minutes? All right, seeing none, we'll look for a motion to approve the November 7th, 2023 minutes. I move that we approve the minutes of the November 7th, 2023 commission meeting. With the corrections made? Yes, with the corrections second made. That motion. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Item C, uh, declarations of conflict of interest from commissioners with any of tonight's agenda items. Okay, seeing none, we will move to our public comment period. This is an opportunity for the public to address the commission. Uh, we do have one public hearing this evening. That's towards the end of the meeting, item G. You may address the commission regarding that item at that point. Any other items uh, can be addressed to the commission now. Seeing no public comment, we will move to our presentations. We have one presentation this evening uh, from Amanda Christensen. And I'm actually going to start first before she does. Go ahead. Um, Amanda's going to talk to us about some of her accomplishments and the accomplishments of our extension office and the university or Utah State University. Um, I, she, I'm going to, I'm going to read the letter. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you have to, you have to hear this. Uh, Amanda, I, I was at her inauguration, whatever you might want to call it, for her becoming a professor 
at Utah State University. I attended that, and this was what was said about Amanda. Amanda H. Christensen, AFC, and I don't know what the FC is, but anyway, is a dynamic extension professor and county director who found her true calling in the field of community education. Her journey began with intentions for a political science degree at USU, but during a pivotal moment in a, in a career seminar class, she discovered the rewarding world of extension work. The prospect of serving the public, educating, conducting research, writing, and forming partnerships with community organizations and leaders ignited her passion. Over the span of 14 years, Amanda has become a multifaceted, innovative professional. Her commitment to financial education and empowerment has had a profound impact. She is the co-principal in investigator for the statewide Empowering Financial Wellness Program, an initiative that has earned consecutive Best of State awards. Through her leadership and expertise, Amanda has played a vital role in advancing the organization's mission of education, outreach, and community development. Her success in securing grant funding, over $5 million worth, is a testament to her passion and skill in championing the causes she holds dear. Her ability to secure grant funding has had a transformative impact on Morgan County's 4-H Youth Development Program she successfully obtained three-year grant funding, which allowed her to hire multiple dedicated 4-H positions. These individuals under Amanda's mentorship went on to expand, enhance, and positively influence young lives in Morgan County. As the expiration date of the grant, as the expiration date of the grant funds approached, Amanda's commitment to the program and her talent for presenting the tangible impacts and ongoing needs of the 4-H initiative became evident. She took her cases to Morgan County, Morgan's County Council, where her passionate ad advocacy and persuasion, persuasive presentation left a lasting impression. The result was a unanimous vote in favor of funding a permanent full-time 4-H program coordinator position, which was long before us. Her leadership, which we would do anyway, <laughs> her leadership is an example of how one person's passion and drive can make a lasting and positive impact on a community. Amanda wears many hats in her role, including being the editor of the influential Utah Money Moms blog and managing its social media platforms. She is also a co-author of the PowerPay Money Master online course providing indi individuals with essential financial knowledge. Amanda's influence extends to the screen and radio as well. She regularly, regularly contributes engaging, engaging and informative personal finance content to KSL's Studio 5 TV show and Utah Public Radio. Throughout her tenure with Extension, Amanda has authored numerous national award-winning materials a testament to her dedication and expertise, expertise in her field. In recognition of her exceptional contributions, she was honored as the re recipient of the USU Extension Innovative Award in 2020, and more recently, the Spirit of Extension Award in 2022. Beyond her professional achievements, Amanda's life is enriched by a few cherished favorites. She finds solace in the sizzle of a McDonald's Diet Coke, which she can now get in Morgan, the majesty of Yellowstone National Park, and the triumphs and heartbreaks of her beloved Atlanta Braves. Taylor Swift tunes set the stage for her many adventures. However, at the center of her world are her loving family, her husband Jake, and their two, two beautiful children, Quinn and Eliza. Amanda's life is a testament to her un unwavering dedication to her work, her community, and her loved ones. I think as a county commission and as a county, we're grateful for the work that you've done. We're proud of your accomplishments of becoming a professor, uh, a full-time, I mean not a full-time, a tenured professor at the at Utah State University, which I think the majority of us went to, some of us did. and. Uh, and we appreciate your hard work at what you're trying to do with the extension. So I'm gonna let her um, turn this, I'm gonna let her take over and she'll explain everything that she's done. Great, thanks Blaine. 
thanks for inviting me to share. Um, I did do an inaugural lecture a couple of weeks ago, and Blaine came to that. Uh, Commissioner Fackrell was there and um, invited me here tonight to share that presentation. So I've pared it down a little bit in hopes to, to um, get through it a little quicker than, than uh, two weeks ago. But thanks for inviting me. I, the inaugural lecture came into existence when a few university presidents ago decided that just getting a letter in the mail that said, congrats, you're a full professor, wasn't quite enough. So they made everybody, <laughs> so they made everybody create the, you know, present this inaugural lecture, which I don't know if that was fair either, but uh, the purpose was well-intentioned, right? I do believe in the mission of extension and the impact that preventative education can have on communities and those partnerships, so my career is certainly just a piece of the pie that adds joy and fulfillment to my life, so thanks for giving me the chance to talk about that tonight with you. I've titled my remarks Pivot Points. Uh, pivot points are studied by day traders. They are used to isolate upward or downward trends in the value of a commodity. So careful study of pivot points can then hopefully predict a downturn or an uptick in, in the value. So the idea of buying low and selling high, this is what you study to help be successful with that. So I have pondered on what pivot points of my career have been and what might have enabled me to successfully navigate that full promotion and tenure process with USU Extension. Uh, here's the by the numbers summary of 14 years of scholarly work, ob obtaining, as was mentioned, over five million of external, internal uh, funding of, of all sorts, um, authoring presentations and publishing articles and awards. I probably need a 14 year sabbatical at this point, but that's, uh, that's okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> by the numbers is just really not the best way though to qualify or quantify the work that's done in this kind of a, a role. And my extension programming looks a whole lot different today than it did when I first came to Morgan 14 years ago. But speaking of innovation, shortly after taking the job and moving to Morgan, a major newspaper headline read, uh, marijuana growing operation discovered near Morgan. And they found millions of dollars of marijuana really growing in a remote location just outside of Porterville. Do you remember this? This was 2011, so this was not an approved growing situation at the time. However, today, today USU Extension will tell you exactly how to grow medical cannabis. So Morgan County was really just innovating before innovation was cool. I'd like to share some innovative program efforts with you. But first, I'll answer a few commonly asked questions that I've received through this process. The first being, was there something specific that led you to your current profession? And I, there was. I, I grew up, as was mentioned, I, I grew up wanting to be a politician. My grandmother was the mayor of the town that I grew up in, and I thought that was just the coolest thing. So I grew up wanting to be the mayor, and I went to Utah State with a political science major and a family finance minor. And then I, my parents would ask me frequently, what are you going to do with a political science degree? To which I just replied, be a politician, obviously, because that's just, that just made sense in my head at the time. Then a pivot point, sitting in Alina Johnson's family finance class at Utah State, she's a senior lecturer at USU, she made an announcement about a research project she was involved in where she was going to study how happily married couples manage their money. And when that class got over, the, the 300 to 400 students that were trying to get out of that theater style classroom, I was trying to get down to her to say, I want to be part of that. I want to know what that's all about. Sign me up for that research study. That intrigued me greatly. Put me to work. This mentor relationship led to changing my degree, for which my parents are eternally grateful, to family finance. And then she shared with me a strengths-based approach, meaning teaching someone how to teach personal finance in a way that makes people feel like it's a positive thing, rather than the, the negatives that are commonly taught with regard to that topic or what we're not doing right, right? So that, that affected me to this day. That theory affects that strengths-based approach, affects how I teach, how I create resources, and um, really everything I do. So as I progressed then through the upper coursework of that degree, an internship was required. And that led me to the Cache County Extension Office at the time where I met Adri Roberts, another pivot point for me in my career. She had a way of mentoring interns that uh, I've never seen since, and I've tried to emulate uh, up to this point. Adri called me then 
I was working with her and I, I was in West Yellowstone though for the summer. I spent all the summers in between the years of college working and living in West Yellowstone, Montana. So she told me there's a job opening in Morgan County for a faculty position and you should apply. It'll be really good interview experience. And uh, the greatest blessings in my life have come from following through on that advice. So a huge pivot point for me. This is one reason we love having interns in our office and appreciate the commission's funding to be able to do that. What requirements then do you need to get to this point in your career is another question I have received. Um, how does one become tenured twice? So I, I, don't, I don't remember. PTSD has kind of blocked out that experience and I never want to go back. <laughs> this is the honest truth. But I will explain briefly that to become tenured the first time, uh, you're required to go through, you have six years to do it. And if you can't do it in six years, you have uh, the opportunity to find another job. So uh, then at that point, once you're tenured the first time, uh, you can take as long as you need to to become what's called fully tenured. Um, the soonest you can do that is in a six, another six year time period, which is what I did. Uh, and then uh, there's a funny story we like to tell about the pens. I'm holding a box. It's a, there's a pen inside this box in this photo. Upon receiving the official phone call from your dean, the university then invites you to a promotion and tenure uh, sort of a celebration where they have you walk up on stage and they hand you a pen. <laughs> say, good job, job well done, here's a pen. It's a nice pen, to be fair, but um, it's hanging, the box is hanging on the wall in my office. Both boxes are, because I've earned two of them to this point. It's a, a very important thing to realize that the most important things in life are usually not recognized uh, through your, you know, are usually uh, family and community and um, not maybe necessarily uh, work achievements. So the pen is a good reminder that you also have to take these moments and celebrate them on your own. You know, you have to do it justice, right? So uh, do your own celebrating some justice. I took the opportunity to do that in Rome uh, last year, which was wonderful. So the last response to questions I'm asked frequently is what should I, I ask people what I should talk about for this inaugural lecture. And basically the, the thing they wanted to know the most was just to highlight the people in the programs that are most meaningful to me. So I'll share three examples of innovation, impact, and efforts to think outside the box with extension programming. So despite the fact that my mother has her 10-year 4-H pin, I did not grow up a 4-H'er. Uh, I remember I didn't know a thing about horse or livestock when I started my job in 2009, and those were really the only, the, the most, uh, they're probably the only, it was fair to say, 4-H programs happening in Morgan County at that time were related to those topics. So when I arrived, I didn't pretend like I knew, what I, but I said, put me to work. I'm here to help. Uh, one, I, one fond memory is purchasing a lamb at the county uh, livestock auction at the fair, which we then sold and turned into ham uh, eventually, which was delicious and wonderful. And I remember picking up that 4-H lamb on Saturday night at the county fair. And I will tell you, I have never been back to the livestock barn at the county fair on a Saturday night. Because you know what's going on on a Saturday night at the livestock barn at the county fair? It's a bunch of 4-H'ers saying goodbye to the lambs that they've raised from basically bottle-fed forward. And it is not necessarily a happy place to be. So then I dug in and I just tried to make myself useful even though my expertise wasn't really in 4-H in livestock and horse programming. Um, I volunteered. I'll tell you the spouse that will volunteer on the county fair board with you is the spouse that's really in it forever in spite of whatever. So you bring your baby and your husband and, uh, and you volunteer because that's what you do. I knew I had to develop relationships, so when I was first hired, I invited 4-H volunteers that were currently active in Morgan County to a Taggart's dinner. And I passed around a sign-up sheet and asked who wants to be involved on a 4-H, uh, volunteer 4-H advisory committee. And then together with those folks that opted in, we determined that after school programming, team leadership programming, and summer camp programming were, were the most important needs for 4-H at that time, that those would be the areas that we would continue to build. This photo is a, a picture of the first place FCS presentation winners at state 4-H contests. It's one of the first three, I think my shirt says 2013, so it was a few years after I was hired. These girls are now women and uh, with careers and making great impacts in the world. 
I expanded the 4-H program then, as was mentioned, every year upon being hired, including obtaining a, a nearly $400,000 grant to hire that full-time 4-H program coordinator from 2014 to 2017. This is another pivot point, because with those funds, hiring full-time and part-time folks, a course of interns, and many volunteers, we created a very robust county 4-H program with programs for youth of all ages, K through 12, to participate in. We established uh, a very successful 4-H teen council. These are pictures of two separate groups uh, in Washington, D.C. at the 4-H Citizen Washington Focus Program. All in all, Morgan County boasts five, five state 4-H ambassadors, two state healthy living ambassadors, four state 4-H contest public speaking award winners, and one 4-H notable. Uh, we, Morgan County is known for teen youth leadership across the state of Utah in 4-H. To date, we've hosted nearly 6,000 4-H activities with 150,000 4-H contacts. Many of those are people that return, right? They come, they're contacts, so they're not individual numbers, contacts of people that we've, we've reached. And then in 2017, as was mentioned, the Morgan County Council voted unanimously to provide ongoing funding for her position as that grant expired. She would be here with us tonight, but she is taking a Thanksgiving break, which is well-deserved, so uh, we wish her uh, happy Thanksgiving. Hiring her and mentoring her, if I didn't have full confidence that the 4-H program wasn't in really good hands, I wouldn't be moving forward with other programs for Morgan County that, that I currently oversee, so she's a huge part of what makes this possible. Um, and those boys and girls that I've worked with 10 and to 12 years ago are now women and men, and 4-H youth are four times more likely to make positive contributions in their communities, and the list goes on and on. So. Watching 4-Hers flourish is um, still something I love to see. Utah Money Moms is another um, sort of innovative program, something that not many extension professionals were doing at the time or really are still. Uh, fewer and fewer people, though, were coming to what I call affectionately butts in seats classes in Morgan. Uh, even though after a countywide needs assessment in 2016 concluded that the, the number one topic people wanted was personal finance. They wanted to know that. Uh, but we would host a class, we'd advertise it, and then no one would show up. And one possible reason, just one possible reason, is there may, there may be a stigma attached to showing up to a class about reducing debt or improving your credit or learning how to budget in a small community where walking in the room you're really likely to know somebody, right? So I thought, how do we then Pair this then with the statistics that confirm that women, so women particularly score lower on financial literacy tests. They're more likely to take a break and come back to the workforce, which puts them then behind for promotion, for earning potential, for retirement. They experience a disparity with the gender wage gap, which is worse in Utah than it is nationally. All of this at a time, then 2018, when anyone could start an Instagram account and call themselves an expert and claim that they knew everything about personal finance. I thought, well, I am an expert. So with the help of USU's marketing team, we um, developed the brand and launched the Utah Money Moms Instagram and, and blog and Facebook pages. I write blog articles regularly. I post on the Instagram account regularly. And I interact on Instagram stories, which is probably my favorite place to be, answering questions and sharing expertise and connecting people to credible sources and always back to extension sources which is the goal. This is a, a, a pivotal point to be on this, in this platform, in this way, engaging with upcoming generations of extension patrons. So now when we see a critical topic, I hop right on Instagram stories and say, what questions do you have about the child tax credit? Or student loan repayment is happening, and here are three things you need to do now if that affects you. Um, Utah Money Moms, uh, as an extension program as a whole, received a first place national award and multiple states have asked me to share how I connect that, um, not sort of a non-traditional, we'd call this a non-traditional extension program, back to traditional extension programs in counties and communities. What do I care about most when asked to respond, that bottom right hand box, when asked to respond to a survey, are you learning anything from following along here? The answer is yes. They re followers report increased ability and motivation to save, to pay down debt, and then improved financial confidence. I'll share one story. This program and platform allows me to connect with women 
to provide personal finance education. And uh, I have met very, well, the statistics are what they are. I have met very capable and hungry to learn and very smart women through this platform. One example is Sydney. When I met her, she told me that I'd pulled her out of poverty and I couldn't really, I asked her to, to explain it. I couldn't imagine that someone would, would say that. She was, he had been divorced and had, um, had experienced um, financial abuse while married. So she was starting from scratch at the time of her divorce. She found Utah Money Moms and started doing the weekly personal finance challenges that we do on that, on that platform. She had taken a free webinar and she was currently taking the Power Pay Money Master online course. She told me, please continue what you're doing. You, are, you have no idea who you are impacting. Utah Money Moms was Sydney's first exposure to extension programming. And once there, she consumed all she could to better her situation. Uh, we work really hard as extension faculty all across the state in every county to connect the need in the community with the people who, who need it, right? To figure out how that connection can be made. It all means nothing without people who are willing to engage in our programs. And so I will be forever inspired by them, and Sydney is certainly a hero and an example of that. Uh, the final program that I'll share tonight, when I tell people, this is the Power Pay Money Master online course that launched in early 2020. Remember what else, what else launched in early 2020? This was a pivot point, for sure. When I tell people, like the dental hygienist, the hairdresser, the neighbor, the gal in Sunday school, that my degrees are in personal finance and family finance, 95% of them respond with, I wish I knew more about that. I wish I had taken a class about that. So pairing that with the need in the county and a statewide needs assessment in 2019 that showed personal finance in the top three requested educational topics for both rural and urban Utahs, Utahns, I wrote content and filmed videos for a completely self-paced, convenient, video-based online course. The goal is to teach people of all learning styles personal finance best practices. I, I had a hunch that it would be well received. It was November of 2008 when I started the process. I spent all of 2019 finishing the process. And honestly, once again, PTSD has also blocked out most of that memory. And I, I don't think I could do it again. I can keep it updated and keep the content current, but it was quite a project. Um, when I wanted to throw in the towel, something said, people need this, keep going. If you build it, they will come. So, and they did. The course was launched in early 2020, and we timed that one really well. To date, 2,200 people have registered for that online course. And that course holds USU Extension's online course record for most orders in a single day, with 532 people signing up in September of this year, on September 13th. It also holds the single month revenue record for USU Extension online courses, bringing in 36,000, almost $37,000 uh, that day. The grant that I have then is covering the cost for people to take the course. So that money then funnels back in helping to create more online course content and update co online course content. So high tides lift all ships. 93% uh, what do we care about most though? Again, 93% of participants increased financial wellness at the time of the exit survey and maybe even more important to point out, 84% continue to report an increase in personal financial well-being four months later. I uh, received a $26,000 grant to create the online course. That was, USU Extension gave me that money to create the online course. That then, I, that then I believe was a pivotal reason why I was funded our first three year grant for $897,000 and, and then earlier and this year funded for $2 million to continue for another th three years to continue to teach personal finance education across the state of Utah. So this was a pivot point and has certainly be, been recognized by the state of Utah as an important uh, topic to continue to fund. Uh, two more stories of people that mean the most to me. Diana in, here introduced herself to me at a personal finance training. She saw me and asked if we could, we could talk. So we stepped aside from the group and she became overwhelmed with emotion as she shared uh, what she had that what she had learned in the Power Pay Money Master course had changed her family's life. They had paid down over $10,000 in debt in one year. They had emergency savings that they were continuing to build, and they were currently planning and saving for a vacation that they would not be charging to a credit card, a first in her lifetime. 
one more. I, uh, Shana emailed me after an event that I had spoke at asking, what can I do to do what you do? Uh, which was, I want to do what you do. And um, this kind of work, she said, I, I want to know what, I, what kind of education I would need to make that happen. Uh, which means more to me than um, almost anything, someone who would want to further their education and try to do something uh, similar. She, last I talked to Shana, she was looking into starting the process to become a money coach. And I'm sure her influence will help many others. So uh, back to the beginning here, a well-crafted research or evidence-based community education program really can change people's lives. That's the goal of extension, that's the partnership, that's what we bring to the table, to put knowledge to work, which means taking current research and sharing with our communities how that knowledge can improve lives through practical and applied action. I was drawn to a career in extension as that I understood the primary goal was to bring the university to the people. As I pondered on the pivot points of my career, like what they have been and how they've enabled me to successfully navigate full tenure and promotion process, I can clearly see these pivot points were only made possible through collaboration and mentoring. In other words, nobody obtains or achieves tenure in a silo, ever. That's always a result of collaboration and mentoring. And this county's council is certainly a key collaborator in that success. Future projects. I um, am excited to take another three years of personal finance programming um, and see what we can do with that to help um, people deal with. If you think that post-pandemic finances are better off, uh, you'd be wrong. <laughs> people um, need personal finance education now more than ever. Uh, I also am excited to see the 4-H Entrepreneur Program building in Morgan and hope to see that continue to take off. That's a fun one. A Spanish translation of the PowerPay Money Master online course is underway and will launch first of next year. I am currently working with the State Office of Education to revamp the Finance in the Classroom website that's used by teachers and students and parents to provide for further financial education resources in the classroom. And uh, my goal would be before I retire to see permanent legislative funding for personal finance educators in the state of Utah. So we'll see. Uh, we'll work with the dean on that one and see, uh, see if we can get somewhere there. I'll leave you with the challenge to ponder on your own pivot points and reflect the people and the, the situations maybe involved in your success that made something in life or in a career pivotal to you or your public service. Say thanks, tell them it mattered, send them a text or a card. Gratitude is the time of year that we're focused in and it's contagious and that culture of support that you curate through this process of thinking through your pivot points and thanking the people that are connected to them will impact the people and the causes that matter most to you more than I think we know. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think she's a great asset to our county and her programs that she's brought about have been great and i think the public ought to um you know if we can somehow get the message out to the public it, i'm hoping they they watch tonight um what she's doing and what for the extension program bringing the university to the people and i think that's one of the great goals of what the university extension program is and she uh, we're lucky to have her Great. Congratulations on your second day. Thanks very much. <laughs> There's not a third, so thank heaven. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you. you, Amanda. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Well done. Okay, we will move to our action items under Section F. Uh, action item number one. Jeremy, do you want to present this one? This is regarding uh, an MOU to become part of the state cybersecurity grant program. Um, so basically, this uh, Sentinel-1 is a uh, software that goes on all the computers that actually has AI behind it that looks for attacks, blocks attacks, and also as part of that service, we have actual people that will come in and help us remotely fix any attacks that happens. Um, that That's $7,000 <coughs> right there, uh, just for that we have no before which is what we kind of talked about a while ago the education for each employee that will go out to them um, and the spear phishing uh, 
uh, tests and stuff like that we talked about. And then there's uh, training specifically for the IT department for Security Plus training and different seminars we go to for free. Uh, and this adds up to about $20,000 a year. There's zero cost, there's no match. We can quit within 21 days anytime we want. I don't know why we want to. But this is an awesome thing. We've been working with the state since last October, uh, going through this whole process. So we're pretty excited about it. I think, uh, I mean, the nice thing is it's they're giving us basically a grant of $20,000, and it basically pays for all of this, correct? Correct. Well, they, we don't pay anything. We don't, we pay don't get anything. a bill or anything. We're just signing on. And we don't have to go and request the money or anything. We just we just want to join the program. Okay. We just sign the MOU. That's it. <clears throat> Any questions for Jeremy? Any concerns with the contract? No. And and it's just the MOU. It does talk about there could be additional services. Um, top of page five. All additional services must be paid for and contracted between the LGE and the vendor directly. And I just made a comment on the document, but Jeremy responded that um, if we um, let's see, if we would, if we were to decide we want one of the other services, we just have to pay for it. And so I don't think there's any anticipated services. No, there is it's no just Sentinel One does all kinds of things, but we're, we're only the package that they're talking about. I'm sure they'll try to sell us things too, but that's how salespeople work. So. But no, there's no cost. We don't have to buy anything. Uh, they may have something really cool that I'll come back later and say, hey, this would be awesome to have. But as part of this, there's no funds transfer whatsoever. And all of the notes that I made on the MOU were addressed by Jeremy. I didn't see any, any other issues. Jeremy, I just had one quick question. Um, just above the signature line on the MOU, there was three check boxes. Are we supposed to be checking all three of those? It was Project One, Did Managed Detection and Response. This afternoon? Yeah. yeah. All three are supposed to be checked, and then we request them as a backup. Okay, perfect. That's what I thought. Okay. Got it. Okay, any other questions? All right, if not, we'll look for a motion on item number one. I can make a motion that we approve the memorandum of understanding between the Utah Cyber Center and Morgan County as presented. I'll second it. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We'll move on to item. Number two, uh, Lisa Wright, Discussion Decision Morgan Valley Arts Council, request for donation for risers and guardrail. Thank you for this opportunity to um, talk with you about something I feel really passionate about and something that we are really excited to um, be bringing um, to Morgan County and that is the, the Morgan County Arts Council. Um, I know some of you have been to some of our um, productions that we've done, Lamb of God, um, last spring, and we are now in the process of getting ready um, the Messiah for um, this coming time. We also generally have a, a, an arts, big arts extravaganza. Um, this year we had to postpone that because of the remodeling that was going on in the high school auditorium. But the, the Morgan County Arts Council, um, one of the things I wanted to hope to understand is what our mission is. Uh, we are a 501c3 or um, registered with uh, the state of Utah as a charitable organization. Those took place or those, those were finalized last winter. And so the Arts Council is a very new organization. Um, but the mission that we have is to bring Morgan Valley citizens together through positive experiences with the arts, either as active participants or providing opportunities for audiences. 
Um, we want to pr promote and support our Morgan Valley artists, including visual, performing, literary, and culinary, by providing avenues to share their work with the greater community. And this is more of a long-term goal, but we plan to be involved and growing and becoming st stronger as we support the different arts groups. Um, one of the long-term goal is to um, prov uh, create or promote opportunities for Morgan Valley to become a destination center for quality artistic endeavors. And um, I think there's such a great opportunity there. We have amazing people um, who are in the arts and involved in the arts, and um, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. As I mentioned, we are in the process of preparing for the Messiah. This will be the third annual Messiah. Um, the first one was happened before the pandemic, then two years we were without that. And last year, um, the, the Arts Council was formed but didn't have all of its credentials, but was involved in doing the production of that, um, including the promotion and setting up all the things. Emily Pfeiffer, who is our conductor and organizer, is this county is really lucky to have her. She is an amazing talent um, in conducting both choral and orchestral music and knowing how to bring the best out of the people that work with her. And it's an absolute joy to work with her and to be um, in one of her choirs or be with her orchestra. But she's, she is really a lot of the, lot of the genius behind um, the works that have happened. But we're in the process of doing that. Last year, we really discovered in the process, um, we had close to a 100 member um, choir that was there. And because of the way that the, that Messiah is set up, the choir has to stand the entire time. So an hour, an hour a little bit extra than an hour. And we have some older members of the community that are in our choir. We have some that had some challenges, um, in, including myself, I have a compression fracture in my back um, that has twisted one of my ribs, and I didn't know if I, the, the first time we did the dress rehearsal, I didn't know if I was going to be able to even perform or, and, and stay with the choir the rest of the time because of how painful it was to stand that whole long time, and so I did some different things and tried to work on some different things to make it better but it was a very it was a challenging situation we found this this year we have had people that have had to drop out or back off because of the requirement to stand and with the way that Messiah set up or with Lamb of God or other oratorios or at times when the choir is working with an, an orchestra you can't bring 70 people onto the stage and then they sing and then you take them back off and then the orchestra plays and you bring 70 people on and you know and through this they have to be there and so what um in in talking with um emily pfeiffer and other members of the group that we have it was suggested that probably the best thing that we could do would be to acquire seated risers which are just wider risers um, the ones in particular here that we are requesting funding for are three feet the, the risers are three feet wide as opposed to the typical ones that are at the high school of about this wide so we're talking three feet wide where you can put a chair and and the person can stand in front and then be seated and then in front um, that is going to make a huge difference in being able to continue to do um, performances and be able to do oratorios like Messiah, like Lamb of God, and so many others that um, we have talked about being able to perform alongside of the um, Morgan Valley Orchestra. Um, so uh, along with the Messiah, I just wanted to, I have invitations for you all for the Messiah that is coming up on the 17th of December, and I will leave those with you and um, hope that you will you will um, be our guest at the Messiah this year. Um, as you'll see in the um, in the information that I provided, we have I've done 
We have contacted an individual who has uh, supplied us with some different bids and what it would take. And the one that looks like it would be the best for our situation and what we're looking at is from, um, it's from an organization called, um, oh, I just went out of my head. Schools in. Schools in. What's that? Schools in. Schools in is the broker that we've mm -hmm. been working with. And um, it's National Public Seating is the, the name of the company that we're looking at to do the, the risers. Um, they are expensive. I'm not going to, and you, you saw the price tag on that of 22000 almost $22,500 for those. They, are, they have a 10-year warranty on the risers. They are... Um, able to handle 200 pounds per square foot, um, which some of the others are not that we had looked at um, that had a lesser cost, but they weren't able to handle the, the poundage per square foot. They are easily folded up and, and widened out so that um, putting them together and then having them ready is going to be a fairly easy process. Um, but I, in addition, it's not just providing some place for a bunch of people to come and stand and sing. I think what um, being able to provide these risers for people will be able to enable, we will allow a lot of people that wouldn't be able to sing with us and wouldn't be able to participate in this kind of experience, that opportunity. And it will provide a, a greater opportunity for Morgan County residents who, who come and participate with us as an audience. And so we would ask that um, you consider um, the, the funding request for the, the risers, the seated risers that we're looking at, and possibly through the ramp funds um, or whichever appropriate funds that you feel. Where would you store them? Right now, I have, we have done some checking around. I know the county doesn't have any room. The schools don't have any room. Kelly and I <laughs> right now have a barn in our back area that we could clear out um, some space to store them in that, in that location. The other place that we could look at is um, actually getting uh, storage facility in one of the in one of the storage areas in the county where we could store them there you know we could maybe possibly put it up at the uh, where the boat is up in the whatever that place that is emergency management area yeah the search and rescue yeah knowledge. search and re yeah I, these will take a lot of space they're, they're pretty large are they Okay, I there's a lot of sets of them. Um, I mean, ideally, you get an enclosed trailer and you put them all in that and you leave them. And just leave them in there if we but could. How big? But is that's that? another. How cost. much area does it? Yeah, how much area does it take, or would it take to store it? Well, you've got you've got four sections, so four heights okay. that are eight feet long, three feet wide. You've got five sets of that, so there's 20 of those that are square, three feet long, eight feet wide. So that's like, and these fold up like a fold like a banquet like a, table. Like yeah. a table is exactly. So it's like having 20 banquet tables, just for the straight pieces, and then you've got another section that's four high, and then that are pie shaped that for are, your yeah. corners. There's another four of those. So, I mean, you're you're talking a decent sized space. I mean, so a 40 by 20 wouldn't work. Oh yeah. I well, mean that, a 40 by eight. There you know, one of those containers. Oh, that would be more than enough for you. You could probably put it in a 20 16 by, by 20, 20 by 10. Or 16 by 8. 8 by 16, thank you. Oh, trailer. Okay. I, I think you'd fit them because you could put them on their sides. But So, Lisa, I don't know what your thoughts are, but as you were talking about this, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of our hometown. Um, when, when they sing at the hometown, the Chamber of Commerce put that on. I was thinking of hometown multiple, Christmas. Yeah, there's, mm -hmm. it feels like there's multi, there multiple other um, times when we can actually use this 
there the are. Fair, the fair, yeah. we could possibly use it too. It just And that's, you know, that's what I included in, in the proposal that Morgan Valley Arts Council and our, our productions don't need to be the only ones using it. I think this would be a very advantageous thing to have. We've also got the, um, the Morgan Valley, or the Morgan um, Community Choir and I know, and I don't want, I hope I don't offend anybody, but there, a lot of them are getting older and it is getting really hard for them to um, stand through those, those shows. Older. Well, I'm one of the junior I'm members of, of that choir. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, as you get older, I can try. You be one of the you senior need to members sit. of well, we the. Has, there's some 80 year olds in, in, those, in both of the choirs. We've got 80 year olds uh, <laughs> in the choirs. I'm start. I'm starting to knock at the door of that, and like I was saying, I with <laughs> with the situation with I have that I have with my back, um, it's not going to keep. I will not let it keep me out of it. But it has been. It, I was surprised how painful it was <laughs> to do the Messiah for me last year, and the young woman we brought a, a good friend who started yesterday or Sunday with the choir. And she looked at me, she goes, are we standing for this whole time? It was her first time to come, and I said, we are. And she said, I can't do that. So I how long will it take to get these? These will not, we wouldn't be able to get these for Messiah. We're hoping to be able to get them for Lamb of God. But this particular company, once it's paid for and the, everything's signed, they can um, deliver it within one to two weeks. So you could get it. I didn't think this was a formal conflict of interest, but I, I will say I'm the tenor section leader <laughs> <laughs> for this. I don't get paid or compensated, but I will. Um, I, I, I certainly recognize the need. Um, it is not easy to stand for an entire concert, regardless of how old you are, whether it bothers you in your back, your legs, or your feet. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I, I wholeheartedly concur that Emily Pfeiffer is exceptional. Just, you know, anytime she calls and says, you want to sing in a choir, I'm like, absolutely. If you're directing it, I'm there because you just learn things from her and she's exceptional. And we are very fortunate to have someone that talented. And I think the whole group in both of these choirs and the other organizations, it's, it's significant volunteer work. I mean, you, you pay dues, you, you bring the cookies for the refreshments for the people who come and listen to you sing. I mean, it's, it's just something you do because you love to, to be involved in something like that or you appreciate the music. So I think this is clearly um, something that we ought to support. My question is the best way to do it. Can we do a contribution to the art society and they buy it, own it, store it, control it, or is it something that we're looking to acquire as the county for the benefit of each of these organizations? And I know you sent us the public bidding stuff while we've been talking about this, and that might suggest that we would need to send it out to bid if we were going to do that. I know you've already been through that process, but if we were to we go that route, we would need to probably do that again. And I, I think that would be great. I, you know, we've, we've done some of the work there, but, but certainly if the county were wanting to make it their own, I think that would be great. Yeah, I, I think according to what their definition of recreation is, this is a form of recreation, and it should come from our recreation tax as well, an infrastructure item from yeah. that. Uh, to help pay for it, but I do know that we need to get three bids and If you've only got if you've gotten three I don't know if we need to put it out under an RFP or if we have to do it under a I mean just take those three bids and we can decide or or how do we do it? So I and I don't know if there could be an exception to the bidding requirement under uh, our current code 36.03 um, I'm guessing not. Is it on a state contract or anything like that? Th these people. So, um, under 3602B1, it is talking about any purchase orders over 5,000 are bid in in a manner to, you know, promote the best interests of the public. 
and it just says that the purchasing agent shall it shall attempt to obtain at least three competitive bids which i believe is matt right now uh commissioner wilson so maybe you could look at the bids that came in and then if you want to attempt to gather one or two more competitive bids then i think that that portion of the code would be satisfied i have four but the but two of them are a little older we we started working on this last spring and just seeing how much does this really cost what is it going to take for us to be able to do this how and and so we like i said are they're a little bit older but i can i can surely give you all of the bids and everything that we have okay so just thinking about this and going back to what commissioner mcconnell mentioned there are two options here that i see as well and one is we make a donation they buy it and deal with it the other is the county purchases it I think if the county is going to go that route we do need to identify how we're going to store it what we're going to do with it um, and probably I, how I wouldn't put it in a barn because it's got carpet on it mm -hmm. and, and the mice are going to get to it and ruin it pretty quick so it's going to have to be in a in a storage something to me the best option is a trailer that it can sit in all the time and then when somebody needs it they come get the trailer and take it set it mm -hmm. up and bring it back mm -hmm. That would also be less wear and tear and banging on the equipment every time you move it. It's going to get banged around just by nature of. Yeah. And the walls of the choir room. From yeah, my experience with the other ones, but. <laughs> so I'm also on the stage crew. <laughs> he is on the stage crew. <laughs> so I think we ought to consider that too. If we're going to do that, we probably had, ought to have an adequate place to store it and transport it. Yes. And, and a method to do that. I don't know exactly what that would look like. Again, my guess is you could probably get an eight by 16 trailer and it would fit fine in that. Um, and maybe the better solution is wait till it comes and really look at it and measure it and make sure it would fit in something like that. But I think we ought to at least consider that if that's what we're gonna do. Can I do any additional homework for you in making that decision? Um, I would get with Matt, but but potentially, yeah, that may be helpful, you know, to, and maybe we could reach out to the company and say, tell us what this looks like, you know? <laughs> If we're to stack it all up, how big is this thing, you know, so we can... You know, and that, that is because I know what it looks like when it's out. I know what it looks like to fold it and open it, but not when it's all together. I know it, it, I know it comes on three pallets that, uh, if you want to know how much they weigh, this particular, this particular set that we're talking about is... Um, well, it... They'd be longer pallets if they're eight feet long probably the the pallets oh it's right here um one pallet is 600 will bring in 600 pounds the second is 385 pounds and pallet number three is 100 pounds so they're going so the to weight's be not bad 1200 pounds total a little less than that yeah any trailer would handle that yeah maybe even a six by eight would work i don't know the interesting thing is the other one that we had the quote on um, the first skid and they didn't say pallets the first skid was 1300 pounds so there is a quite a bit of difference between the different styles that they have too so, so depending on the style one other just question mm -hmm. that you might want to look into is so the shell at the high school the sound shell yeah fits with that configuration I, I'm assuming they're eight foot at the back, but we would, mm -hmm. we might want to look into that too. Okay. And I mean, we could probably set it back a little bit further, but yeah, this is this will be shaped the same as the one at the high school. There's there's several different configurations, but this will be able to blend should blend into the to the shell at the high school. So. And it, it has a capacity of 106 people, adults, plus their chairs. So what I'm going to recommend is that we, um, instead of doing a donation, because I know the auditors were having trouble with us doing uh, donations, they wanted us to purchase. So what we need to do is decide and let Matt work with uh, Mrs. Wright on that um, to 
determine the best location, what to buy it, and what other item we need to do, uh, you know, for storage. I like the idea of a wheeled trailer that we can go and pull it if we need to with the public works, and then the county would own it for those purposes that are needed, and we can draw the funds from the ramp tax. The other thing, Matt, I know that they make for these, because I looked into it a little bit, is they make a, a rack that's on wheels that these can sit on. It may be wise to look into buying that so we can just wheel it right into a trailer and you don't have to carry piece by piece and wheel it into a building. Is that what the high school currently has? Is no, each one of them has their individual set of wheels and you grab one end and march down the hallway. Each one of the risers? Each riser, the section? Yeah, each it section has a two wheels on one end. Okay. Pick it up on the other and then if you go to that Open schools in website, and they've got relatively scary. They do have a lot of things that, <laughs> that you can get accessories. Um, do we know how much funding we have available in in that area? Depends on if you want to charge any more for the sports. Well, uh, all I'm thinking is when we looked at the budget, we've essentially allocated everything from the no. ramp tax out. No, we didn't. didn't. No, we did not. What did we, we not only gave her? We only gave her two hundred thousand dollars from that. And what's our revenues? And our revenues as of as of because those do fluctuate, don't they? Yeah, they fluctuate. We're we're averaging between two hundred and two hundred and three up to two hundred and twenty a year from that tax. Plus, we have some leftover. Yeah, we got a balance from the past. Is the fund balance sufficient to cover this? Because mm -hmm. we need to cover it from that initially, yeah. I think. Okay. Well, then that, that sounds good to me. So there is funding, and it's restricted funding. A, a is for arts. That's exactly right. correct. R-A-M-P. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think this is a very, very worthwhile project, and appreciate all the legwork you've done on this. Appreciate your husband coming and sitting through yet another commission meeting <laughs> we sat through plenty of these <laughs> i actually think lisa that you taught me piano 30 plus years ago uh, you um, when are i was Michael very Newton very young taught piano yep, too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time uh, unfortunately yeah, i didn't have as much facial hair then well, <laughs> it, you taught him piano and i taught him ffa and ag so he has changed a bunch <laughs> been, a, been a little while. A great student. <laughs> <laughs> Not a real great student because I didn't keep up on it, but. Well, darn it, you can come on back. We'll <laughs> Sounds <do> good. <laughs> so, so speaking of our youth and choir conductors, when I was a kid, I sang in a children's choir, and Emily reminds me of this director. Her name was Jane Olive, a woman of the '60s, and if she, if you remember, laugh in. Mm -hmm. And the expression, sock it to me, mm -hmm. she would be trying to get us to sing louder and louder. Come on, come on, sock it to me. <laughs> and it was just fun. I'll never forget her. She also taught me piano. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gina, uh, this is such a brief introduction into what, we're, what the Morgan Valley Arts Council is all about. And at some time, I would like to bring Emily Pfeiffer and, and do a presentation you know, a brief presentation and just kind of give you a better overview of what we're all about and what we're hoping to become as, um, and it, it's not like we need to grow artists here. We have artists here. We just want to pull people together and, and, um, and to promote people and to really share. I think art can be such a great way of bringing people together within a community or within a valley and, um, we have such a beautiful place to, to live in, and what a beautiful way to bring people together. Sounds great, we would love that. All right, so I will, 801-814-1787. Okay, so did I just give that out? Yeah. No, you I'm also published it on the website. It's, it's so. on the screen right now. Yeah, so. And it's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk to me about the arts or and, anything else? And your email is there, and too. And my email, too. That's really awesome. And your address. <laughs> well, 
So I am going, can I leave these with you? I have invitations for our county commissioners and if anyone wants to take any players home, we would love to have you at the Messiah. And anyone living or listening out in the ethernet, it's not the ethernet, but wherever you are listening, we'd love to have you YouTube. come too. <laughs> YouTube. Sounds great. Uh, so, thank you. Um, oh. Matt, do you, well, and maybe this is a question for Lisa as well, do you feel like a couple of weeks would be enough time to do our due diligence on this? We can bring it back to our next meeting? Okay. Okay, so if that's being the case, let's get a motion to postpone this to our next meeting and we can make a decision then. I move that we postpone this uh, request from the Morgan Valley Arts Council for two weeks and at that point we can discuss the t final amounts of money. Second. We have a motion and a second to postpone to our next meeting, which is the first meeting in December. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. We really appreciate all of you. And Monday, December 4th, that's the community choir concert. So Sunday the 17th for the Messiah, Monday, December 4th for the community choir. Oh, okay. Where's that? The high school. High school at seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay Cookies we will move. provided out. Okay. <laughs> Are you baking them? <laughs> I, I have an assistant for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the only time she lets me call her the assistant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Kimberly. We're on to item number three. This is request for a refund for a vehicle registration. Um, I, I will note that. The, the actual registration wasn't included in our packet. I do have it here if you'd like to see. The amount is $50. Okay. Anybody wants to see that? So it's basically they purchased it or sold it before. Yeah, they had their reg they had registered their vehicle the beginning of July. Their current registration they had had wasn't going to expire until the end of July. So they just had registered it at the, the beginning of the month. Um, they ended up selling their vehicle towards the end of the month. So before their original registration would have been expired and so the state has granted their refund so that piece of it so they just came to the county for their $50 refund. Okay any questions for Kimberly? That requires county commission consent. It does it really? It's, it's remarkable. Approved. I move to approve. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jeremy, this is a conditional use permit for Brown All-Star Auto Wash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Action item F4 is for application number 23.045 and 23.076. Um, application 23.045 is the site plan application and its accompanying, accompanying conditional use permit is 23.076. This is for the Brown All-Star Auto Wash uh, commercial car wash in the Canyon View Commercial West, or Canyon View Commercial West area. Uh, the property is identified by the, pro by the parcel number and serial number in your meeting packet and is located at 5806 West Canyon View Place in Mountain Green. The applicant is Braden Brown, um, him and his wife are in attendance tonight. Uh, the area of this lot is 1.1 acres. The general plan designates this area as commercial, specifically vehicle oriented commercial, abbreviated VOC in the general plan. The zoning district it's in is highway commercial with those entitlements attached. Staff has, has reviewed this site plan application and finds that it meets all minimum code requirements. There are no fire comments and planning and engineering comments have been addressed as, have, have been submitted and addressed as well by the applicant. The planning commission met on their regularly scheduled meeting on November 9th. Uh, this item was heard and the recommendation to approve to this body from the planning commission was unanimous, five to zero, with member Stevens absent and member Sessions not voting. I, along with Josh, can answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeremy. Any questions for staff? I do. Um, according to what you've got up there, and 
people up there or up there wherever it's at. Um, it's 1.1 acres and so the entrance, I mean the building looks like it's, is it facing outward to the highway or is it facing to the street? Commissioner, that's the reason for the conditional use permit is that is it does have frontage on three separate county roads. Our code in the parking section of our code does have additional setback requirements. So they have to follow not only the building setback requirements, they have to follow setback requirements for uh, these three separate rights of way. Um, for parking, yes. And, and sorry, Jeremy, two, yes. two rights of way. County, two roads, state, the other road. Right? True. Okay. True. All rights of way. <laughs> And they're entering off of our roads, not the state road. True. Okay. It just seemed like the building was turned. Kind of weird. But maybe not. Well, the building's squared with the, yeah, with the property lines. So this approval, uh, sorry, Commissioner Facco, are you done with your questions? I don't know. We'll find okay. out. <laughs> Do you mind? <laughs> no, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is for site plan approval. This or, or is it for conditional? I mean, what what exactly are we? I just want to make sure it's for both. Um, our code is worded such that if they re, um, if they request a conditional use permit for the setbacks for parking, then they would submit a conditional use permit along with the site plan. The conditional use is not for the use itself. The car wash is an allowed permitted use outright. Uh, the conditional use is only uh, for the parking setbacks. And so uh, they've submitted uh, their site plan. Um, because of the size of the site and the, the location of the building, size of the building, 25-foot uh, setbacks on every single property line. Um, I thought since they were meeting the minimum requirements or exceeding the minimum requirements for landscaping already, that they could make a pretty good <coughs> argument for uh, leniency on the parking setbacks. The building meets the setbacks. So but, but the parking is not parking, right? It's back. Uh, right. So that that is part of their parking. Um, I when they calculated the number of parking spaces, it was based on uh, the vacuum stations. So people will pull in, they'll wash their own car, and then they'll they'll leave and park and vacuum and then then leave the site so does this come before us again when it sh has all the utilities and is, is there a final process at all no th this this is their approval and it's located in a platted subdivision so That's i correct. think all of the utilities are there yeah. mm -hmm. correct okay i had a question on I the, guess unless you're looking for the distribution through the site. Yeah, d definitely looking for, I, I don't know, I guess, I, I know the utilities are in the roadways, but it um, seems like there's going to be a bit of water usage. I know when I read the Planning Commission report, they said that, I think the applicant mentioned that 90% of the water is going to be um, well sustainable, reused, whatever you want to say. So I, I don't know, I'm not seeing any of that, but... Uh, yeah, so all the utilities are in the road, uh, including curb gutter sidewalks. Uh, all retention was planned as part of the subdivision for Canyon View Commercial West. Uh, as far as the infrastructure that they'll put in for their site, um, it's part of their construction drawings. So how are they recycling it? Um, that would be a question for the applicant. Okay. I just want to say I appreciate Civic Review and how it's how we get to see those questions so I appreciate it so another comment um, in one of their drawings that there is a retention pond on the I guess it'll be on the east side but I I'm a little bit familiar with the subdivision but I believe they've got a major Pond on the what would be the um, southeast side also. 
Correct. So is that for all the roads, and are they doing this retention for their side? Is that kind of how it works? Or? Yeah, so there, there's going to be some retention on each of the sites, and then it's all, well, I say retention. It's detention, so they'll detain it so it'll release at the uh, historic rates, and then it'll all gather on that south, basically the southerly side uh, on the south uh -huh, That's correct. And so that's where they draw from the re to recycle it. No, the recycling will happen on their site. On the site. applicant okay. will be able to kind of tell you how that okay. works. All right. There it is. Any other questions for staff before we hear from the applicant? Okay, great. Mr. Brown? How's it going? I know a few of you guys. Um, there's a set of holding tanks that are underground that the water drains into and the solids separate at the bottom, moves to the next tank and it's pumped back up into our equipment room and the solids are spun out of it and there's um, a process that cleans the chemicals out of the water and then it goes back down into a holding tank underneath and then the car wash, when it's being used, pulls from that fresh water tank back up into the Total um, water usage is about 150,000 gallons per month, just based off of our projections. Um, we're recycling 85 to 90 percent of that. Um, so as far as fresh water standards go, it's about 20,000 per month because fresh water is um, brought in for the final pass or the spot free rinse and wash. But everything else is recycled. So are these spray bays? So, two automatic bays, two self-serve bays. Okay. Yep. You still play first base? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> A few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? All right. If not, we'll look for a motion on item number four. I can do it. I'll make a motion. <laughs> got it. Okay, Mr. Chair, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the Brown All Star Auto Wash Site Plan, application 23.045, allowing the proposed commercial development located at 5806 West Canyon View Place in Mountain Green, based on the findings and with conditions listed in the staff report dated November 21st, 2023. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Thank you. Now we, need a, we have to do the other one. For the conditions. So, do we need to do two motions for approval? It's right below it. One right below it. The site plan number 23.076. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the Brown All Star Auto Wash CUP application 23.076 and I for the proposed. Commercial development located at 5806 West Canyon View Place in Mount Green, based on the findings and with the conditions listed in the staff report dated November 21st, 2023. We'll second that also. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, we will move on to item number five. Back to you, Jeremy. Uh, Wasatch Peaks Ranch Subdivision Phase 5A Preliminary Plot Approval Request. Action item F5 on tonight's agenda is for application number 23.039. This is a subdivision of 21 lots within a master plan community zoned as resort special district. Located approximately at 4213 North Morgan Valley Drive near Peterson, Utah. And identified by the township and range numbers located in your meeting packet. The applicant tonight is Wasatch Peaks Ranch LLC. The area of this subdivision is 97.5 .5 acres. The general plan has this as the Wasatch Peaks Ranch Development, uh, and the zoning underlying is, is forestry. <coughs> Staff has reviewed this project and finds that it meets all minimum code requirements. Uh, there have been extensive reviews by fire and planning and engineering, and 
all of those comments have been addressed to date. The Planning Commission met uh, with this item on their regularly scheduled meeting on the 9th as well. The recommendation was also unanimous to come to this body for approval. Uh, five, uh, the vote being five to zero, Member Stevens again absent, and Member Sessions not voting. I and Josh can answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is in the audience tonight. Thank you. Jeremy, can you remind us when we approved the concept for this one? The concept plan, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions for staff? So, Garrett, this application was received before the judge made this ruling? That's correct. So it was submitted in July of this year, and the ruling was September 15th of this year. So is this for final plot approval or preliminary? It's all legal for us to go ahead and do this because they had started the process before. Yeah, that's the county's position. Is there any any applications that would vest rights filed prior to the judge's decision or grandfathered under the existing code that it that was in place at the time of the application submittal? Um, there was uh, a lawsuit filed that was removed to federal court. Um, the petitioners in that case have amended the federal uh, lawsuit to only address the 1983 claims, which are the federal claims, and now they've re-filed a complaint against the county in state court that we were served with yesterday, um, alleging or, you know, requesting certain declaratory um, actions by the judge, but that response won't be due until December 11th, and, and if the court rules otherwise, it, it may in, impact the county's position. But everything that we've discussed in the past, nothing has changed as far as prior discussions we've had and direction that's been given. Any questions for the applicant? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> Do you want to come up to the podium for us? <clears throat> okay. Um, I had a question here. You've got, maybe this is for staff too, but some of this portion is 15 to 30% or 20% slope and you've got building envelopes that you've determined are um, where they can build so where it's a 15 to let me pull it up there it is you've got 15 to 25 15 to 25% um, the slope gradients on the site range from shallow, less than 15% to moderately steep, 15 to 25%. So have we done all the geological stuff that needs to be done on that so that, that way we don't have a slippage off the mountainside? Yeah, we, we've done a steep slope analysis. That's part of the package that we submitted. Okay. You that um, with the county. And everything's okay, Josh? Yeah. Okay. All right, and then um, my other question is, is, have, is this part of the land that has already been removed from Greenbelt, or is it not? At this point, I am not positive on that. I apologize. Okay, sure. All right. At the moment of that. Okay. 
Okay. All right. That's something I would like to know in the future is how much of the whole development has been removed from um, Greenbelt. As yet. Uh, you know, because I know some of it has not. I know 7,500 acres have been put into, or hopefully is going to be put into uh, conservation easement, at least that's what we had heard. And I just was kind of curious because people are asking me, has it come out of Greenbelt yet? I don't believe this one has, but I, I think it, it will be. For, yes, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At the moment, yes. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I think a note on the Greenbelt item is that it doesn't come out of Greenbelt until it's been recorded, unless the landowner comes in and voluntarily removes it from Greenbelt. Okay. All right. Okay. Fine. That's all I have. I, I have a question on the uh, geohazard based on other um, conversations we've had. So a geohazard has been done on every one of these lots? We have a geotechnical report and they've studied every single farm site. So there's been a geotech and there's been a geologic hazards report. Both of them have been submitted. Uh, they were submitted uh, as part of this subdivision as well as every other phase. Um, they've done extensive uh, testing, boreholes, test pits, uh, things like that. So as far as our ordinance is concerned, they've met all the minimum requirements for our geologic hazards and the geotech. So what I, I guess what I'm asking, Josh, is we're requiring everybody to do one on each lot right now. Is that what we're requiring them to do? No, that's that's uh, that's not correct. I apologize. Um, a subdivision that comes in, they have to do a geologic hazard study for their entire subdivision, which means that every single lot within the subdivision has to be a buildable lot, and then they, as the developers, have to um, grade out the actual area for the lot so that that cost is not passed on to the future owners. Um, the individuals that come in for a building permit on a lot that is not in a subdivision um, have to go at least to a geologic scoping to have Bill Black, our geologist, determine whether the soils on the site or not are hazardous or not. I'm not a geologist, I can't make that determination. Um, as far as subdivisions as a whole, uh, the developer themselves has to provide buildable lots on every single lot. So that geologic, the geologic hazard study would cover every single lot. Okay, I guess I misunderstood. Yeah, I, I think Commissioner Wilson's referring to our, the however many lots on that, is it the Rome subdivision off the for land? Because when we had that discussion, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Because they said we had to come in, yeah, every single lot had to have a, a geolo geology study or report or scoping. Maybe that's what you meant with All scoping. nine lots. I, well, that's what each, I thought. Each lot. They had to produce a geologic hazard study for all nine lots, but the study was for the entire subdivision. So, yeah. so if they come in and they do nine individual subdivisions because they may come forward and divide the lots through meets and bounds. Uh, in order to make them developable, they'll have to create a subdivision of one lot, nine lots, or whatever. Whatever they choose to do, that subdivision has to have a geologic hazard study done for the entirety of the subdivision. And if it's one lot, it'll be... Yeah, the, I know the ones I've seen, they take the area, you know, whatever they do with it, boundaries, fault line, whatever it is, so they don't care necessarily where the lots are. They just say, here's the hazard. And then the developer has to say, okay, here's what, how I adjust my lots for that. Kind of thing. It, well, it goes beyond that. Because then they have to take that geologic hazard study and they have to grade out the buildable areas for each of the lots. So if there's retaining wall requirements, they would have to put in the retaining wall. That way it doesn't go down to the buyer having to come in and put in the $200,000 retaining wall. All of that has to be done by the developer. <clears throat> I, just want to make sure. I try to treat everybody the same. That's, that's my shtick. I follow the code. Okay. So, I apologize. As of last Friday afternoon, 
There was a conflicts check circulated in our law firms where we've been asked to consider representation of Wasatch Peaks Ranch in a litigation matter adverse to Whitney Croft, Cindy Carter, David Pike, Brandon Peterson, Robert Bowman, and Shelley Page. I don't know whether or not we've actually been engaged. If we have been engaged, then I'm just disclosing that conflict of interest. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant or for staff? Okay. With that, we will look for a motion on item number F5. Thank you. We approve the Wasatch Peaks Subdivision Phase 5A Preliminary Plat Application 23.039, allowing for a 21 lot subdivision of land and it just left. There it is. located at approximately 4213 North Morgan Valley Drive in unincorporated Morgan County based on the findings and with the conditions lifted, listed in the staff report dated November 21st, 2023. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right. <clears throat> we will now move to item F1. This is a public hearing for the PC Zoning text District Text Amendment. Um, two meetings ago, uh, we met to discuss this. Approximately a month ago, uh, there were um, a series of changes requested by Commissioner McConnell and uh, Commissioner Fackrell. I've gone through the text um, and made those changes. Um, the green denotes the changes that were forwarded uh, from the original document by the Planning Commission. The red changes are the red changes are um, the changes that were proposed by you, the Commission, to. I'm just wondering if there are additional changes you'd like to, to make tonight, or are there specific session, sections you'd like to discuss? There was, and I had a whole page of them, and for some reason they're not on my sheet. So I might have to look at it through it again. Maybe that's good for me? <laughs> yeah, it's good for you. Uh, <laughs> and you guys, I know. You guys don't want me to. Okay, one of them is on 8-13A dash 050 PC zone overlay requirements um, on the family single family residential development um, it has to contain a minimum of 15 acres and yet on B it says it only has to contain 5 or 10 so I don't know which one you're proposing I left it's in single family is the 15 acres and multifamily or commercial is five acres. So, so why does it have 10 acres? Because, all right, so one of the discussion points that you had at the last meeting that we discussed this was you weren't sure 50 acres. Right. Um, you thought 50 acres may be too large. You wanted to have a discussion about the size. I put in 15 as a placeholder based on uh, Commissioner McConnell's comments. Five was my original recommendation that I took to the Planning Commission. They recommended 50. Um, that's, that's for single family residential development. Multifamily commercial and industrial development are handled under B, and so the minimum size there, the five was based on the conversations. You didn't know if it should be five or 10. So I've put in placeholders for that discussion. So we're going to change it to five, or we're going to change it to ten. That's the question. <laughs> I <clears throat> I think that a lot of the issues that I've heard that that people in general had with our previous um, PRUD. Thank you. <laughs> ordinance was that it was abused for small situations and you ended up with subdivisions 
the intent was to cluster and have open space, right? But if you have a subdivision of say 10 acres and your your open space was just a little square of grass somewhere or weeds on a hill, it didn't really provide the benefit that we hoped that would bring. So on the one hand, I think that the larger sizes are better in that regard because the, the benefit that you're going to receive in being able to cluster or being able to ask for some type of amenity is probably going to be much greater in a larger subdivision than it would be in a smaller one. Um, that being said, I can see the benefit in some of the smaller subdivisions, so I think it is a balancing act. To some degree, my as I've thought through this, my opinion is maybe we start with a little larger, and if somebody comes in and says, we think you should change it and here's why, and they present a compelling reason why we should change it to a smaller one, great. Um, we could always go through that process and, and amend the, the text, you know, amend the code. I know that that's one more step for people and I'm not trying to add more steps, I'm just, I personally can't see the benefit to the county or to the community for a real small PC project. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing the, the boat on this, maybe there is a project that would, that would work, so that's just my feeling at this point, is I would I err on a little last, larger. 50 acres seems large though. Yeah, the last hearing we asked about that. Yeah, so from my measurements of the area that I, I think you were talking about, it came out to about 65 acres, and that park was approximately two, two and a half acres in size. And that's not including any of the other open spaces that weren't necessarily an amenity. Or right, right. No, I, active I just think that that's a, that's a decent sized after active park with a nice pavilion, yeah. um, a good play area. And to me, that's the type of amenity I think I'd like to see if we're going to move forward with this type of a project or, or type of, zoning. I'll call it zoning product from, from a developer. So maybe the 50 acres isn't that far off. I don't know. And again, I would totally be, if a, if a developer came to us and said, here's why we think it should be 30 acres and showed us a plan and could show us where that would be beneficial, I, I'd be amenable to that change. You could, you could put something in, you could stay, she'll be a minimum of blank a acres unless otherwise approved by the county commission. Or, and then they don't have yeah, to come back and, and ask for And you can say, but, no, but not less than another number if you wanted to. Yeah, that's a good idea. So maybe we do. 50 acres, but not less than 15. And if, you know, they could get special permission to, to go smaller than 50 if they felt like that was. So 50 acres, but not less than 15. That's what we have in here, right? And maybe we do the same on the commercial, you know, 10 acres, but not less than five. And they can come and request it. I, I don't know, I just, It's 15 too small still. I, I like your other idea. <laughs> I'd rather not have both in there, personally. I just, they're always going to choose the smaller if it, and, and we really won't have an opportunity to refute that, will we? If, if we put both in there. That's a good point. I think what it was the order that may have been more confusing. So the general rule is minimum of 50, um, except upon commission approval, but never less. You know, kind of saying, even with commission approval, we're never going below this amount. Yeah. Okay. That, that's how I was understanding what yeah. you're saying. The general but I think rule when is it it's got to be 50 acres or more. Yeah, minimum of 50, but not less than 15, unless approved. Then it's like, well, wait a second. How does that seem a little isn't, more confusing? Isn't there two? There's tier one and tier two on this. Those that are over 50 have a different set of rules. Those under tier one, that's 50 or less. The tiers are only for submittal requirements. So if your development is over 50, over 50 acres, you have more submittal requirements that you will be required to provide. 
provide at time of application. Less than 50 acres, you have a set level of submittal requirements. Tier 2 goes to the next level. And you're going to provide more. Which I think makes sense. On a larger project, you should probably have to provide more. So, would it be worthwhile for us to put something in there about what criteria would would uh, justify. maybe justify going less than the 50 acres? Like something like you know, uh, justification of of a significant value to the county and county residents must be demonstrated, or something like that. I, I don't know how that would read. But I'm not the wordsmith here. Well, and, and, I mean, that's a substantive issue as to what you think are reasonable justifications for reducing the amount, whether it's a county benefit or whether it's a significant improvement in site plan design, you know, as a result of the way they're choosing to cluster or something like that. I think there could be a, a, a few different categories, you know, some criteria. I, I just think that anytime you have a an exception to the rule built in it's good to have some criteria that you judge that exception by otherwise I, I think you're right you end up with what Matt says and everybody's gonna come in and say well but I really think it would be better if I did mine this way even though it's only 20 acres I think the criteria is good as well because the Commission will change over time and so what what the Commission thinks criteria may be at a certain time may change and I think one of the the things that that sometimes the county is accused of is not following the code in the past or or you know you give one exception but not another and the more criteria i think is helpful to establish a good precedent too because reasonable minds can differ and as commissions change at least there's an idea of what you had in mind of what might may justify it already in there if a future commission thinks that that needs to change, they can amend the code, but at least we have something that gives more certainty to our residents as they're looking at code and, and different things that they'd like to do. So in terms of that criteria, is that something maybe, Josh, you can take a stab at just thinking up some criteria that you think would be helpful, or is there criteria that commissioners that you have in mind that you think ought to be included? I think that also would speak to our intent of having this particular zoning, you know, kind of helping both future commission members and planning directors and whoever else, as well as, as residents and developers, kind of understand what that looks like, you know. And then I also know we're ready to move on to another one. One of the other areas is under page, it'd be on page 6, 8-13A-080, uh, number 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, basically, you've got here, if you're single-family residential development with lots of sizes of one acre or greater, shall preserve 50% of the total area for open space, but yet then you have single family less than one acre they only have to main they only have to contain a minimum of 20 percent so can you explain that um, the example that commissioner mcconnell uh, asked for measurements um, that was 65 acres of small lot single family residential and they preserved um, basically 10 percent or less okay we can so this this would require double that, and, double that. Mm -hmm. and then okay. it's split up between active and passive um, amenities. Okay, because they've also got in four and five, it's a 50%. Active area has to has two main options that can be public 
or split or a 50% 50-50 split such as all development shall provide at least half of the active open space and amenities for public use correct so what's that bas what that is what's that basically saying is that of the 20 percent half of it has to be active open space half has to be passive and of the active open space you can either do it one of two ways one half of the 50 percent needs to be open to the public at least or all of it needs to be open to the public <clears throat> all right and then I know there was another area, sorry. I like that, by the way. I think that's a good... Yeah. Uh, the landscaping requirements. We have... <coughs> under E. Is... You're, selling, you're saying in there that if they disturb it by construction, then reseeding and revegetation shall occur to return it to its natural condition. I agree with that. Then it goes here down further and it says that they can zero scape. Which if they zero scape, it's not providing it back to the original. Well, you have, again, you have 50% passive and 50% active, correct? From the above division. And so those areas that are in the, that are part of the subdivision that are gonna be preserved, if the trucks have to go into those areas and they disturb those areas, then they're gonna to have to be reseeded and returned. However, in the areas where you have active, um, like the trails and, or, or whatever else they put in for their active amenities, um, they can xeriscape those areas, that, those areas. So it cuts down on the amount of grass that, all right, I just didn't understand this so. <clears throat> No problem. Okay. In that same section under um, E2, when it talks about case of large areas of preserved open space, how do we define a large area? Do we need to define that there? It, it is kind of a nebulous statement. Yeah, we can define it if you'd like. Um, I, I honestly don't know if it's a problem or not, if it needs to be defined. I'm just curious how we would... I could just take out large. So of areas that are to be preserved. Although we don't want them to preserve a, a park strip in its natural state, right? Because that would right. be... So I, I actually think that large should probably remain. I just don't know how we define that. And I don't know if that's something we need to come up with. I would hesitate to put a, a square footage or acreage or anything on it because I think that could be so... I would let the developer propose something and then... And then let them say, come back to us. Fair enough. So do all development agreements have to come back to us? So this isn't in the form of a development agreement. This is in the form of a narrative and an ordinance, and everything they submit will be attached to the ordinance itself. So it's like a development agreement, but everything is it's maintained in that ordinance. Um, so it'll be easily, I can easily access it through the clerk's office. Um, but it'll still go through that same process where they'll propose their development and they'll go through, um, I hesitate to say negotiations, but they'll go through the legislative process to finalize and determine all of their entitlements based on the county's needs as well as, as, well as their, what they want to develop. Now with that HB 174 or whichever one it is that we have to work with, where they're going to come in with a preliminary and final all at once, is that going to affect this? No, this is the legislative process, and this is where they're asking for additional entitlements beyond what our code would allow in the first place. So if they want to develop um, and get more lots out of, out of their land than what they could get with just a straight zoning classification, this is what they would use to do that. But they need to understand that there's going to be additional requirements that the county commission will, will add in there as part of the legislative process. <clears throat> to define their their requested entitlements. So process-wise, they're going to come in with all of this information when they ask for the rezone, right? That's correct. So there is some risk for the developer in doing this because traditionally for zoning, we don't even see a site plan, and, and we're not even 
we can't even really ask for that. That is correct. But in this case, we're saying well, you're going to provide a site plan. You're going to show us what the lots are going to be. You're going to show us a lot more detail. You're going to show conceptual landscaping. You're going to provide additional lighting information if you want to deviate from our code. You're going to show all the amenities that you're proposing and the phasing of those amenities going in. Um, and so they're going to spend a lot of money just... They're going to spend a lot of money to get to this point if, if they choose to go there. So, I mean, to some degree, they're going to really have to be committed. And frankly, that may affect the size of some of these on its own, right? Because for a very small subdivision, you're not going to go through all this effort because the revenue is just not going to be there when you sell your lots, chances are. Right. But um, I actually like that because that's one of the concerns sometimes we have when a... Thanks when a zoning amendment comes in is we want to know what they plan to do with the property, yeah. right? And that's typically what the public wants to know too, right? Well, what are they going to do with it? And sometimes we struggle with that because it's like, well, we, we can't really ask for a site plan at this point. We just have to decide if the zoning fits. But this is a little different because it's not only does the zoning fit, but does the plan that you have outlined work? So I think that also will help with some of the issues that were had in the past over PRUDs. Yeah, I don't think we would have had the same issue with uh, M and D Nelson. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah. Is does M and D Nelson, where it was only 44 acres, that would that fit under that tier two or tier one? Well, they got the town center zoning, so they already have to come back and get a oh. development agreement through through you okay. and the planning commission um, before they'll be able to. And any town center rezoning in the future will have to submit a conceptual development plan anyway because we modified that code too. Okay. So this section five on the open space requirement being public, the 50% active area has two main options. It is the subject of the sentence. I don't like that, but it shall be required to be all public. Does that mean dedicated to the public, owned by the public, and maintained by the public? No, accessible to the public. But I can clarify that. Um, because my, my recommendation would be that the subdivisions or the developers find a way to maintain the, that uh, infrastructure themselves. And that should be part of any proposed plan from a developer going forward. Is how so, is it going to be maintained? Because we don't have. OK. <clears throat> so I think we need to clarify that. And then I think that public use has to be subject to the reasonable rules and regulations imposed upon the use of that property, from my perspective. I mean, I I'm help maintain and pay for multiple parks within the subdivision in which I live. I don't, I, I never, if I drive by and there's kids playing in the playground, I don't think whose kids are those. but. But if somebody was planning to have, to use the pavilion and they have a reservation process for it, they shouldn't be able to just show up and say, hey, this is public, you know. And, and if they charge the residents for it, they ought to be able to charge the, the public that wants to use it. So I think we need to, one, be clear about what we mean by public. It's simply accessible to the public. Um, mm -hmm. Does those parks become public, or are they HOA also? Well, what he's saying is these would be HOA-owned parks available for public use, and I'm saying, okay, subject to the rules and regulations imposed by the owner of that park. I mean, you can, this is a strange context for it, but we have some of those situations in commercial subdivisions where the jurisdiction wants it to be open to public use, and we allow that, but we prohibit public expression. So that the public has to, if they're looking to exercise their free speech rights, has to find another public forum <laughs> to do that, not our private forum available for public use. So I think we probably need to clarify that. Is that wording work? What's that? The wording I put it in there. I put it in red. Under number oh. five. Number five. Is that not on your screens? Yep. Yeah, I it's, see it. it's right in front of us. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I got too many screens. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're not used to it yet. Oh. Oh, thanks. 
So I had a few comments on <laughs> the amendment section. So in 8.13A100, the third line down, it says public hears. Public notice requirements, I think it means public hearings. Uh, where are you at? 8-13A-100, subpart A. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought we were still in the Which one? It is. It's at the very end. Yeah. So in the A, third line down, public hearings. Okay. Here's. Um. Um, and if I may add, in this section, I added in and existing PRUD subdivisions. Um, Commissioner McConnell recommended that we repeal portions of the subdivision ordinance. Uh, subdivision regulations that deal with amendments so that we don't have two conflicting uh, ordinances. I have not yet taken that language forward to the Planning Commission yet, but I put it in here in anticipation of that. So, and then in subpart B, notwithstanding section A above, minor amendments shall be allowed administratively. So I, I think structurally in terms of the text, I think we need to say in the first one, except as provided below, amendments to the PC overlay, all associated development agreements and existing PRD shall be treated as a rezone. Because the first one states it absolutely, they're all a rezone request. The second one says notwithstanding, so I just think A needs to be qualified by except as provided below and, and if you wanted to say subparagraph b um, and i guess i guess i'm not on number six that no other minor amendments have been granted for the development i'm i'm i don't know that i understand the purpose of that if if each of the minor amendments meet the requirements, I guess what you're saying is you don't want them to piecemeal their way to a zoning change. Yeah. But is that the way that the exception section is supposed to work? Um, yeah, so the way I've tried to set it up is that they're not allowed to do more than a 10% change administratively. If it's more than a 10% increase or decrease to the number of units, if it's more than a 10% change to the building height, et cetera, they're already over what's allowed to be done administratively. No, so I, I get that, but let's say I came in for a 10% change in the total square feet of a proposed building and combined that with a less than a 10% increase or dis decrease in the setback. I would say you should go back through the entitlements because you're asking for more than one administrative change. So and, and if that's what everybody prefers, that's fine. I'm, I'm, if that's the way we want to do it, okay. I was just, I want to be clear about that because it seems to me that you could, you could also say, legislatively. The changes, 10% changes in these various things, building height and so forth, are not something that I think requires re-going through a legislative process. Okay. But if you think that any one of them is okay, but not any combination of them, then what is drafted is what we need. I will change it to however you want it. I mean, I... <clears throat> I can understand the reason for that, and I agree. We don't want somebody trying to piecemeal a whole bunch of changes after the fact. I think that's a hassle both for, for you as staff. Um, I, I think I'm inclined to say, leave it as it is, and if we find that that's a problem, we have multiple instances where people are coming back asking for changes after the fact, then maybe we talk about changing. But yeah, I think, Hopefully, they ask for those changes up front, right? And they don't come back to us after the fact and ask for more and more. And yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there, there could be situations where they have to come back and ask for a change in location of where the retention basins are or where the landscape is going to go because of the slope. 
and there's not a lot of requirements. I mean, there's a lot of requirements that are going to be submitted, but they're really they're preliminary. And so they, if they come back and the site slopes a different way, then the water may flow a different way, which would require a change. But so I suppose another happy medium could be that it should say no more than two minor amendments. You know, so maybe there are two situations that they could do that way, but after that it's done. I don't know if that <coughs> satisfies both sides of it or not, of the argument or not. I agree with Matt, though. You want to deter a lot of major stuff, and I, I realize these are considered minor. I don't know. If, if we changed it to be no more than two, would that, do you think that would have resolved the concern? Yeah, I mean, I think that's helpful. So, so let's say we come in with a, they come in with a concept plan and a conceptual layout, and we are requiring them to do a lot of the work up front in order to get the overlay, and that's fine. I think that's reasonable to ask. Let's say as they move forward with the engineering of their project, there's they need to modify some road layouts slightly shift around it they still maintain all of the same standards they don't increase their density you know but we're only allowing them minor amendments are well let me see rearrangement of the proposed structures or development elements as long as there is no change in height square feet or total number of units so when you say the structures could they change the lot layout or should they be allowed to? Because from my perspective, if as, as a result of the engineering, yeah. the road alignment shifts. I mean, because this stuff comes on in layers as as they work through the engineering. If the roads shift and the and the lot alignment shifts, but they don't increase the number of the lots, they still meet, maintain the same lot sizes and all of those requirements. To me, that's administrative. I don't want to see it again. I don't either. You know, the, the <laughs> only it's only trying to to do what you said. Yeah. Well, and I suppose when you the coming down to it, these these are these are minor, right? And we've listed what those minor ones are. Right. So they're not going to come back with major stuff that would. When I read these, none of these change the the number of of units or lots. Um, they really don't even change the size of the units or lots, do they? I mean, well, just it would allow for a ten percent change up or down. Okay. Would allow for a ten percent change in the building height. Okay. W what if you put something Space. in that said minor amendments or a combination of minor amendments that change the zoning are not allowed or, or something? Because I think that that's what the the worry was: is if there's so many minors, maybe it does change the entitlement somehow. Is that a flood? <laughs> I don't love that they could change the amount of units. Yeah, that I don't. That's want. in there. And and the that's question, that's density at that point, you know. Yeah, that's true. It does say total number of units. I mean, if you're looking at a ten percent, I mean, let's just take for instance the Morgan Valley Partners. They came in with five hundred and fourteen to begin with in their development agreement. Then they come down to a hundred and fourteen or thirty or whatever it is. Now they're down to twenty nine. That's more than the ten percent. So how does this compensate for that? Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't, because it's uh, completely different. So in other words, they'd have to come back and do another development agreement according to what we're saying here. It's going to be completely up to your decision whether you're going to extend it or whether you're going to require them to do a different a new one. <clears throat> but that's something completely different. Well, so that being said, maybe the solution here is to remove some of the things that we don't want them to change, like the number of units. So I mean, we my, could just remove that entirely. We, you could. It's true. My argument for it is that they are spending money up front to do yeah. a conceptual development plan. They haven't completely designed the site, and maybe through their planning, they are able to fit in one or two extra lots. Because of the amount of open space and amenities that they're going to be providing the county and county residents, maybe maybe that's something that's built in. However, if their design provides for more than a 10% increase, then they're coming back. And I suppose if they are 
complying with every other aspect of this, maybe we don't care if they get an extra lot or two. Well, that well, maybe, maybe ten percent is too high. But when you, say, what, when you say when you say three hundred units, that's thirty. Yeah, that's true. If it was a very big project, yeah, that could be. So may, maybe ten percent is too high when it comes to that. So maybe you reduce that to five percent. Um, and then in the rearrangement of the proposed structures or development elements, I think that addresses the other concerns, that, or that sent, sentence could, if we said the rearrangement of the proposed lot and street layout, proposed structures or development elements, as long as there is no change in height, square foot, or total number of units to be developed that exceeds one or two. Above. So you want me to add street layout? Yeah, street and lot layout. The only structures that would be um, shown on their conceptual development plan at that point would be um, amenity buildings like pools. Yeah, you've already accommodated that. I'm not asking you to eliminate that. I'm just saying you've got a conceptual road layout and lot layout that's going to change and adjust potentially based on the engineering and okay. if we're still maintaining the open space elements and all of that I'm okay with that did you want to keep that 10% or do you want to lower that to 52 for the number 2 the building height yeah well so in a residential subdivision what are we 35 feet 35 feet so you could potentially allow three and a half more feet, 30 and a half feet. Well, we've got also in a commercial lot up to 50 feet, according to what we got, we got allow up to 55. I mean, those, those, you don't have the same factor in your multiplication, right? Lot, a, a PRD of a thousand lots, you know, 10% is 100. That's, True. that's a significant Big thing. A, a height change to accommodate a parapet design of, you know, five feet in a commercial or, um, you know, topography in a residential subdivision, to me that's not so significant. But I'm open to any other. I'm just curious, this might be away from this, but if I build a barn that's higher than 35 feet, I can't do it? How many of them in our county are higher than 35 feet? I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right. Keep in, keep in mind, though, it's the it's the average height, right? Because you measure on every side of the structure, that's and it's the average height. So you could have a structure that's... It's not on every side. You take the highest point uh, elevation, you take the lowest elevation where the, the building hits the ground, and you take the midpoint <coughs> of that, that line, and it's 35 feet from gotcha. the Gotcha. So it, it could end up being high. Okay, all right. So there are houses. There are houses um, in, in Mount Green where one side of the house exceeds 35 feet. However, they meet the definition of building height by our code. Especially when you build into a hillside, that's pretty easy to do. Yeah, yeah I, I've seen different measurement standards that make it super difficult to build on a hillside. <laughs> and it's like holy oh, smokes. Okay, any other comments on these items? I had them all earlier, but I don't have them now, so I'm lucky. Okay. I think he's made most of the changes except for adding in the criteria, which I think probably takes a little bit of time. Yeah, a little bit of work. But yeah, let me look at what I was emailed by Matt, um, or Commissioner Wilson, sorry. And then, um, thanks. And then um, I'll draft some criteria with, uh, with Garrett's help, and we'll bring it back. What's the second meeting? Is it the 19th? The 19th. Yeah, Christmas. Would that be all right? Yeah, it's the 19th. Okay. Also, um, we can incorporate our newly adopted um, title chapter references. Oh, yeah. And, and so we can put those in so that it matches um, oh, that'd be great. the recodification. Mm -hmm. And then, Josh, if you want to go back to the eight. 13A50 
when we're talking about the minimum area requirements. I wasn't sure if, I know earlier we had talked about, but n not to go below a certain amount, and I don't know if that want, if you wanted that incorporated or if you just wanted it to be open and then whatever criteria is brought back. Because I do know at the beginning we were saying, but not less than 15 to put at least a floor I on would, it. I would rather do just that, is have it, have it a, not necessarily a minimum, let them come to us and give us their ideas if it fits everything else in the code. Okay. Give us some good criteria that will help us judge it. Okay. Um, is there a way we could hold the public hearing tonight and then the next time I can just put it on as an action item and talk about it? Or do you want to hold that? Public hearing it's on legit, the agenda. Garrett? From yeah, we only have to have I one public hearing and it was noticed for a public hearing. Okay, today. So yeah, we'll do the public hearing. Um, before we go into that, I just wanted to say, Josh, this has been a tremendous amount of work on your part and, and your team's part. So thank you. I think um, it's definitely been thought through very well and, and this has gone through a lot of iterations <laughs> and a lot of changes between the Planning Commission and the County Commission. And I, I just want to make that publicly known that, that uh, we don't take this lightly and this is not a quick change it's been ongoing for several months and there's been a lot of discussion about it so thank you for all the work here we're we're almost to the finish line on this thank you as well appreciate it okay second we have a motion a second to enter into a public hearing regarding the pc zone district text amendment all those in favor aye, aye. any opposed okay we are now in public hearing Tina Kelly, Mountain Green. This is the only way to get it within four inches. <laughs> um, I was hoping you would do the public hearing at the next meeting so that we would have an opportunity to read those changes. It was really hard to follow. Um, especially, I tried to read it before I came in and, and follow it, and it, where it changes back and forth. I don't know what the red is, I don't know what the green is, if those changes are going through or not, and whether to comment to those changes. And I tried to follow along as you were going through, and without knowing what those criteria are, it's hard to make comments to that. I did. I have been opposed to this, and I think you know why. I was on the council dealing with the PRUDs and PUDs that came out of the last ordinance, and so I have appreciated that you are willing to look at it and put some, a lot of work and effort into it. But I would really like an opportunity to see the language changes and comment to those. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no additional public comment, I will look for a motion to adjourn hearing and reconvene the public meeting. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We are now back in the public meeting. Uh, on item G1. Yes. Sure. There can always be more opportunities for public hearing, but to meet our code, we have to have at least the one. I think it's a reasonable request. I wasn't. I hope they heard that. Um, I think it's a great one to also do. So. Okay. With that, we'll look I for a motion. I think that's your then. direction for public hearing. But um, I think that in terms of the text of the document, um, you might want to include both a red line and then a clean copy. So, but to answer the question, all of the red and green was included to be intended for adoption unless it was struck. It, it was just coming from different sources. But it might be good next time once it's done to include a black line. I don't think you need this red and green. It would just be the new changes and then a clean copy. Then somebody can just read through and see. Yes. 
So now what do we do? Now we need a motion. A motion to postpone it. Correct. Okay. To our second meeting in December. I move that we postpone the uh, determination of this amendment to our code till the second meeting in December. To include a public hearing? To include a public hearing. I'll second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. All right. That brings us to our commissioner comment period. Um, looks like I'm up first. I don't have any major comments, just uh, several of us attended the Utah Association of Counties meetings last week, um, along with several of the elected officials from the county. Um, had some good discussions with other county leaders and, and good learning opportunities, so appreciated that. Um, I did just want to give you an update on uh, the bridge project in, uh, into Croydon. Um, that is moving forward. Um, at a fairly quick rate. It looks like they got the bent caps on uh, today or yesterday. They've got them wrapped in blankets, keeping them warm through the cold weather tonight. Um, so that, that is moving forward. Of course, the temporary bridge has been removed and we're on the detour route. Um, so far, the road is holding together barely. So that's my report from, from that project. Commissioner Fackrell. Okay. Um. I would like to request that we do a relook at the subdivision road rules that we passed recently. Uh, I do not know the exact number of that one, but it was requiring the rural, the rural, the ones that required them to have a paved road, even though they didn't have to have curb and gutter. And I would like to um, look at that again and have it not be required as a paved unless it's a larger than three lot subdivision so i don't we, know if that's we do feasible have driveway requirements and you could do a shared driveway couldn't you that's not paved for a small project sorry <laughs> so the paved driveway says an all-weather surface that'll support a seventy-five thousand pound apparatus it's 26 feet wide with 20 feet of all-weather surface um, so it's that could be gravel potentially potentially yep um, it has there has to be a, a subgrade and a base and then whatever you put on for that all-weather surface um, it has to be pretty much has to be designed and reviewed by our engineer and inspected when it's completed and that can service up to how many residences um, our code only says more than two so if you have two or more lots that you want to have a shared driveway it doesn't have an upper limit so two or more or more than two it says two or more now that might be something we discuss it because I'm I don't know just with the questions I'm starting to have is on two lots that I don't know. I just well, it sounds like there's already a provision, is what I was getting at, that would allow a non paved road for two lots. If that's the, the concern. But they have to have. meet all the other requirements of right. 75,000. So but if you have a one lot subdivision, you don't have to. So why would we be having a discrepancy if you have a one lot subdivision? They don't have to go through the 75,000 pound fire code. And yet on a two, we do. Uh, it has road access on it. Right. So a one-lot subdivision is going to have frontage and road access on the county road. And the shared driveway that goes up and serves additional lots isn't necessarily going to have that access on a county road or the UDOT road. And the uh, UDOT owned. Statement. Well, it might be good for you to sit down with Josh and talk through that. the scenario because it sounds like okay. you got a particular one in mind. Well, I've got a few in mind, so private I will lanes, sit down and talk to him. So private lanes typically can only apply to, uh, if I remember correctly, agriculture property. And so they can have an access easement or a private lane um, where they don't require the frontage, frontage requirements. But every other subdivision 
each lot that's created has to have frontage on a county road. So if you want to look it up. And we don't want dirt roads for county roads. We want a paved surface. Yeah, I've worked so in that's a community that, that allowed dirt roads, and that was a nightmare. Okay, I'll have to come and talk with you because I've got some in question with that, so I will come and talk to you. Okay. Um, another thing that was discussed and... Dinner. What? It's your dinner time? I'm sorry. The meetings are until 10 o'clock. He, he sent me a, <laughs> I sent him some candy and he said he wanted dinner instead. So. You just got to plan on this meeting being long, especially if I'm here. Um, okay, some of the things that we went through that you guys were not involved in at UAC that we need to be concerned about, or at least I don't like being called out on the carpet in these meetings. Uh, where Morgan is not involved in any of these committees, these steer steering committees, government operations, and so forth. We need more participation from uh, elected officials on those. It doesn't have to be commissioners. It can be others. And so when they send out the request, please think of whether or not you can or you can't. And if you can't, let me know so that I can, okay? That's just letting you know, because I will. Um, Those are UAC committees. UAC committees. And one of the things that I thought was an interesting point for the public and you guys is if we were to, this is for public works, if we were to chip seal a good road, it only costs 58000 per mile. If we have to build a new road, it's 614000 per mile. So um, this year, Senator Winterton is going to Brad's be told us that millions of times. He's, he's well aware of that. Yeah. And we have a plan that includes that because we know that it's costly to replace okay. versus repair. Senator Winterton is coming up with a, um, there is a legislation going forward this year that we need to be concerned about oil and gas severance tax which all of us will participate in even though we do not produce oil and gas in this county at this point so um, one of the other things was is the revenue and taxation they are planning on having uh, uh, they're pushing for the convenience stores to start paying the one percent on prepared foods so to increase our re revenue for tax, uh, for restaurant tax. Um, and then they're trying to also make another, they're trying to get consistency amongst all counties for recreation management. And I don't know how they're gonna do it, but that was just some of the information. Um, the other thing I have a question on and we all need to be concerned about is, is our applicant period finished for our county administrator? or not as of tonight and if so when are we going to start interviewing yeah 40 applicants we've got 40 applicants i think we should close it now um and my suggestion is i put together a spreadsheet listing all of the applicants and some very basic information from their resumes i will email that out to the commission i think we should all go through that and just note those that we think would be worth interviewing we absolutely cannot do 40 interviews there's just no way so we've, we've got to limit that down. I'd like to shrink that down considerably um, before we do interviews. So I think if we take the next maybe week to go through those individually, decide which ones you feel like are worth interviewing, we can then compile a list of those that we think need to be interviewed. and we can go from Like there. submit three to five names to you? Or? I mean, whatever you think, but... If, if we end up with 20 people, I still think that's too many to interview. Um, we just can't spend the time to do that. So if you feel like there's seven on there that are really good, I, I think that ought to be noted. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say limit it. I just, mm -hmm. to a certain number, I would just say go through and the ones that you feel like really stand out, let's interview them. Let's interview them. Okay. So are we going to try to do interviewing next week? Um, 
we probably could. I think we need to have probably until at least next Tuesday or Wednesday to go through those, especially with the holiday. Josh, did you have a comment? <laughs> um, would it be possible for like maybe the top candidates that you end up interviewing to allow the elected officials and department heads to also hold interviews and then we could provide you kind of with our list of things that we've I think it'd be a good idea I, I do think it would be good to, to have some involvement I mean at the end of the day you're yeah. gonna have to work with them um, well I, I understand it's, it's your decision but um, in other places I've worked we found it helpful when the department heads interviewed the new town manager as well and provided some input and um, recommendations and then the county commission and we could probably schedule that I mean maybe maybe you just do two interviews and they come in and do them consecutively and they go in and meet with meet the commission with commission and, and then the with available the department I think it's a great idea I think that I do, would work I do well too. thank you I think it's a so great let, idea. we can start looking at that um, let's see how many we come up with and then we can start talking about timing for interviews so basically, stop up at new midnight tonight. No, stop it at stop it at the end of the night if you can. So like midnight tonight, or I, well, I don't expect you to stay until midnight to click the button, but more people will apply. <laughs> but <laughs> we are getting some good candidates. So we've we've had <laughs> a number of good candidates, I think, apply based on their resumes and a few that we know. Um, so that's good too. So yeah. I'm pleased with the, the candidate pool, certainly. Okay, that's all I have for now. Oh, other than, can we go into the closed session to discuss litigation and property purchases and sales? Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner <laughs> McCollum. So the YCC transitional housing project is moving forward. Um, it's under construction. They had a couple of delays that um, related to some groundwater that they discovered and uh, frankly the historical trolley line that used to run in Ogden um, under the road. They just apparently paid up, paved over that. So when you go oh, to bore for a pipe and you run into a trolley track, it's harder. Um, <laughs> so that's going well. Um, Commissioner Fackrell's comments reminded me that I should remind those who wish to run for county commission for my district should apply. It's early in January. So, it's the second three the For fifth. those who may be listening online or in the audience. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. Buster just wanted me to. Uh, let everybody know that the Robert McConnell awnings will be installed here shortly. So you'll be able to see those on Nine Lines hangar. That building's looking pretty good. And I appreciate the fact that there are attempts to make it look, have kind of multiple fronts, even if they're just aesthetic. Yeah, and it it's going to look nice. He's He cares, so. The Robert McConnell awnings. I'm I'll take it. You're, you're honored by that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Commissioner Anderson had to leave early for another commitment. Um, so that brings us to the end of our meeting. We do have a request to move into a closed session for the purpose of discussing the purchase or disposition of real property and pending litigation. Um, all those in favor of moving into, sorry. Why don't you, well, you made that motion, I guess, didn't you? I move, I move that we go into closed session to discuss litigation and property acquisition or sale. I'll second. Your motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. <laughs>